Are you going to fight about the Pledge of Allegiance like Cox? Ryan, can you call roll? <laughs> Mayor Godis. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Wilman. Here. Councilor Step. Yes. Councilor Wusso. Councilor Dame. Here. Councilor Kelp. Councilor Hershey. Present. We have a quorum. Are there any agenda changes or conflicts of interest tonight? Nope. Okay. Um, <clears throat> citizens. Oh, council announcements. These are announcements for anything going on with boards or commissions or anything else. <laughs> nope. Okay. Uh, citizens appearing before council for the items not on the agenda. Christian. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, I'm here representing Hotel Colorado. We have an opportunity to bring a short-term piece of business uh, to the town, spend over $50,000, um, and they need an exclusive use of the parking garage uh, for about a 12-day period from uh, February 23rd through uh, March 6th. They will be providing 24-hour security. I believe they will all be um, Bentleys uh, used for a special event up in Aspen. Um, they're, they're willing to pay for use of the garage. So I'm here making an ask of, uh, would council support uh, the temporary uh, closure to the public for the parking garage and uh, some revenue for the city's parks department? How much are they going to rent out the garage? You tell me. What's it for? <clears throat> uh, for a high-end automotive group. So they have to put the cars in and the garage and store them and there'll be guards 24 hours a day. The, the entire garage. I think thousand dollars a day. I think you can go higher than that, sir. You say that it seems conservative. I was just trying to be nice to my friend Christian. Yes, you know. <laughs> if you're familiar with this concept, could you throw out a number that you've seen it in the uh, yeah, the mayor. Yes. Sorry, I, I had to activate it. I think I did. No, it's still red. Hold on. Sorry, thank you. We would appreciate your professional recommendation of, of a range, maybe. I think we probably can get between two and four thousand dollars a day. Okay, thank you. Uh, would a staff sorry, can I get a staff recommendation on whether this is something that staff would recommend? No, no, not saying no, just no recommendation. Oh, okay. I really <laughs> <laughs> well played, sir. I really don't know what to tell. Already. I kind of had a similar question to legal. Is this something we do that we uh, can do? We, we haven't done something at this scale before. Um, we've had a little bit of an internal discussion. Um, I think we, the top deck um, at one point, we had uh, uh, some kind of a brewer festival up there, but right. that was the last thing like this. Certainly we have done, um, you know, short-term leases and closures of streets for various events. Um, I would note this is a fairly lengthy one that will, you know, um, have an impact on parking downtown because the garage is full most days. Um, so you just need to be aware of that depending on what direction you decide to go with it. Thank you. Um, again, I'm sorry, upper and lower deck? Yes. Uh, um, and certainly 12, 12 days. 12 days. And if we need to help uh, with uh, some of the downtown vehicles, the hotel could make parking at the hotel available for some displaced people if that helps. That was going to be my question is, can we accommodate people in any way around town to help? Steve's not looking at me, so. Uh, I'm <laughs> Think of this, I'm charming tonight. Um, <laughs> and is, how can we help the general public if we allow this? And Christian has already said he can offer some parking, but if you're full, you're full. Right. Yeah, but if these people have all their cars down there, I will have parking available at the hotel. Oh, I see. So they would come in, they would park for us. That that helps clear up a lot. Thank you. Yeah, and I do think that we'll take a little bit of a hard time for people because it's kind of a long closure. Um, a lot of people that park in that parking lot are employees of the Forest Service. So, you know, if we call over there and buy them lunch or something and tell them we love them and are nice to them, you know, maybe they'll take it easy on us. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, Christian, CAC, I, I didn't part. hear when, what 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 dates we talked about. Uh, it would start on February twenty third and uh, through the sixth. 
So we've got to head at spring break time. Yes, and after President's Day. Oh, yes. After President's Day, before spring break. And remind me that was a daily rate? Yes, for, for I, given the range that was proposed, I would say I would go at the upper end of that range because you're gonna you're gonna you're going to take some heat over this, but I you know it is an opportunity to bring some business to town that otherwise we wouldn't have. I think we wouldn't take a whole lot of heat if we did five thousand a day. Five. I'd make that motion. Second. Uh, been moved and second. Is there a conversation less more? Um, oh, sorry. I'm comfortable with the amount, but I would like to know where it's going to be appropriated. Maybe we could put it into something in the downtown core or maybe just use that at staff's discretion and then also take legal recommendation and a few hundred dollars towards um, the forest service to buy them lunch. Or I'm sorry, it wasn't legal counsel. It was our interim city manager. How about yep. a future board? I, I, I think if... <clears throat> If staff wants to have discretion on that, that's great. I'm not going to include that in my motion, but if you want to knock those guys out, that's great. I think the where go, I'll also leave that to staff discretion. Um, knowing that we often ask our city manager for city manager's discretionary funds for fun stuff we want to do. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. Thank you. Christian, what kind of cars are they? Uh, don't have modern? Exactly modern? Yes. Okay, like yeah. six-figure cars. Yeah. Like newer, though, not yeah. like brand new. Not new. <clears throat> Thanks, everyone. Like supercars. Miss Holloway. We have three minutes. Give your name and if you live in the city or not. Linda Holloway, city resident. At the 323-21 PNC meeting, staff stated that the owner of 405 Laurel was granted a reduction of three required off-street parking guest spaces by the community development director as long as all tenant parking was located on site. The next meeting actually held for 2721. Staff stated that because of the required architectural design standards, three tandem spaces were likely to be lost due to changes in floor plans. Gretchen Rice Hill and project architect Meyer both stated that getting those three tandem spaces off street and on site was going to be very difficult. The PNC said as long as it wasn't more than a total of three spaces moved from on site to on street, it would be all right. Neither staff nor PNC commissioners considered the fact that there were already three guest off site on street parking spaces approved. <laughs> Adding the three lost tandem spaces to the three guest parking spaces made six vehicles now parked on the streets instead of on site. Unfortunately, at that, P that PNC 427 remote meeting, the public was locked out. Please look at the photos. Please read the text when you can. The staff photo I titled Mis Magical Disappearing Park Cars with only one parking car park on all of Laurel was presented as evidence of, quote, the parking situation, unquote, on Laurel by staff for that P323 meeting. It was get good enough to mislead everybody. It appears that no one parks on Laurel. Now let's look at the picture with vehicles parking all up and down Laurel. That's normal. Next, confusion with public comment. At the 323 hearing, the PNC chair invited public comment for the unusual 4-6 meeting. The chair even gave instructions as to how and where to submit public comment, noting comments would have to, quote, come in quicker because of the short turnaround. At least four citizens followed those instructions and submitted timely comments for the April 6 meeting, which failed to occur due to technical difficulties and was to be continued until April 27. On April 27, the chair said, quote, so if nothing happened, I will not reopen the public portions since you guys had a month to send us additional <laughs> comments, ignoring the public comments. This is a mess. I appeal for a civil city council hearing on 405 Laurel prior to a certificate of occupancy being approved, basically rubber stamped. Thank you. Thank you. 
Early. Um, yeah, thank you. And, and I've talked to Linda about this. Uh, we had a conversation yesterday, the day before, and, uh, and I think as Carl has indicated a memo, uh, the appeal time is run. If there are things, Linda, and Carl maybe can fill me in on this or let you. Sure, sorry, I'll I'll speak up. Um, if there, we can't, there is no appeal to council at this level two years later. However, if, there are, if they're not complying with the permit, the development permit, then there may be things we could do. So I think that's probably the next step for you. And Carl, maybe you could just weigh in yeah, on that. Yeah, no, um, I think Steve and I will take a look um, and get with the community development department to confirm um, and we'll have confirmation that uh, the project is being developed um, per the approvals that were granted in, in 21. Uh, obviously, the, the appeal time period is laid out in the code um, and also in the rules of civil procedure has, has passed by almost two years on this matter. So an appeal is not appropriate in front of council, but we will take a look to make sure uh, that they're abiding by their development permit. I, I can't I'm going to stand during the meeting. Oh, uh, Charlie, or sorry, Tony, do you have something to say? No, no, I'm just he's, standing. He's, oh, oh, sorry. Back issue that's I thought you're yeah. trying to be recognized. The, no. the okay. other, <laughs> the other thing that I would and talk to Ingrid about this as well. But I mean, the other thing I think we need to be careful about is I don't think Linda, when I talked to her, was aware <laughs> that there was the ability when it doesn't come to council as part of the normal review process. There's ability to bring it before council. So I think we need to try to come up. And I, I'm not critical right. of anything. I'm just saying, I think we need to, when there's opposition to some of P and Z, I think we need to make sure we let those people know there, if you don't agree with our decision, this is what you need to do. Right. So they know that because the common person's not going to know that there's those time limits. Right. And obviously council um, receives notice of planning commission decisions that are subject to call up um, by you, as opposed to uh, this one probably was one that was subject to appeal to you, which is a little bit different. Uh, under the code, but in either case, um, we'll maybe have a conversation with the planning commission chair about current planning commission chair about just including that in the announcement after the close of every application or something like that. Thank you. All right. Uh, we've already done public comment, Linda. I'm so sorry. I just wanted uh, to describe what happened. I, I'm sorry. We, we, we've already done public comment. I'm really sorry. We have to continue our meeting. Thank you, though. Do we have anybody online or else in the room for public comment? Is there anybody else that would like to do public comment? You have the list. I do. <laughs> and I, I don't think that Joe Biden is probably. He's busy. He's, he's, he's OK. <clears throat> anybody else online? I don't see any hands. I don't see anybody else for comments for items not appearing on the agenda. All right. Seeing none, we'll close public. Oh, there you go. Uh, Robert McGregor, if we can promote him. Okay. Robert, do you have your, are you on mute? How's that? That's perfect, thank you. Great, thanks guys. Um, Robert McGregor, 3925 County Road 154. I think technically the second reading of the affordable housing um, amendment is not on the agenda. And I believe this it, is- it, sort of... it, 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 Robert, it is. So it's, oh, okay. second, All right. it's item number 11 um, after the downtown design standard overlay. So if you can, hang out for a little bit and give comment on that, yeah. that would be wonderful. I apologize. I thought uh, it might no, no, you're fine. off. I hope to catch you later. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh -huh. All right, anybody else? Okay, we'll close public okay. comment. Uh, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Marco, seconded by Ingrid. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, item number 10, ordinance 2023-03, downtown design standard overlay.
Good evening, Danielle Campbell, Economic Development Specialist. Stepping in for Hannah, <laughs> um, going through uh, design uh, standards and retail uses. Um, just as for a quick reference here, uh, we're really trying to focus. Um, there's no formal code action being taken tonight. Staff is really just looking for a direction on a public meeting. Uh, this was discussed uh, in the last work session to move forward in a public meeting to get some feedback from them on these design overlay standards that are being presented today. Um, I do wanna take a little bit of time just to remind council of where it is today and address a couple of the previous concerns that have been talked about. Um, but I'll try to do, go through this as quickly as possible to save most, most of our time for discussion. Um, just for some quick background, the purpose of these design standards are to really activate um, and increase the vibrancy of our current downtown um, to really promote that pedestrian oriented business and service character. Uh, these design standards do not impact uh, only non-residential buildings and new construction. So really with new construction, this would impact 75% of the gross area floor to be required to be sales or um, lodging tax uses. And one of the things I do wanna focus a little bit is that these parking structures uh, for future design outline will not be impacted. So they are exempt from this. Um, and all current off-street parking will be in the rear of the building as part of this overlay design standard. So a couple of the council concerns that we've talked about previously, um, I really wanna go through a couple of these just to give a reminder of where they stand today for this overlay district. Um, first one being, there was conversation to do a market feasibility study. Council did not move forward with that one, um, but the rest I will address throughout a couple of these different slides. First being the current boundary map that exists here and P and Z, we've talked about expanding and decreasing. And as of right now, the boundary really focuses on um, Grand Avenue or Grand, Grand as well as a, a block of 6th Street. And so it has definitely shrunken down to what is presented today. And a couple of additional items that we really want to focus on is, again, it's 75% of ground floor requirement scenarios. And really a lot of the conversation that we've had previously was the idea of it impacting residential buildings. And so the one couple of items that I do want to address is if an existing residential building is demolished and a new building is proposed, residential or non, the standards do not apply here. If a residential building is proposed on a vacant lot, the standards do not apply. However, if a non-residential building is proposed on a vacant lot, the standards do apply here. And if an existing non-residential building is demolished and a new building is proposed, residential or non-residential, the standards do apply. So just making sure those, those distinctions are pretty clear for council. And a couple of the other conversations that we've had previously was the idea of sales tax and lodging revenues versus uses. So we really wanted to identify what that really looks like when we're talking about that vibrancy and increasing that through that 75% area on the first ground floor of a new construction building. So that 75% would include retail, restaurants, bars, grocery stores, vacation rentals, and gift shops. So things that are to that sort. However, I think it's really important to also talk about what the 25% or what really wouldn't be allowed through these new construction, which that would include professional offices, hot springs, massage, yoga studios, real estate office, libraries, different things like that. So just to give a really clear understanding of moving forward in this type of district overlay of what that really looks like and how we're really separating those two uses of sales, tax, and lodging revenues. So with that, um, we really wanna focus this conversation again on understanding what the approach is for a public meeting if we wanna move forward in that direction. For example, of council availability, general approach, what is the exact feedback we really need to see in order to, if we wanna keep moving forward with this district overlay. And I'm happy to ask any, answer any questions as well as Emery. Questions? Charlie, Paula, Kelly. So Danielle, when I when I looked at the uh, the um, 
map of where we're going to be. I thought we had uh, we had discussed, and I didn't go back and look at the minutes. I did read all the the the, uh, the, the attachments, but I thought in the map we included the area along six and twenty four because that's a, that is an extension of the downtown area that it's going to happen. I believe if you look at the six three plan in the future. And I'm wondering why did that get excluded because oversight or did it get excluded for some other reason? You understand what, what I'm talking about? The Sixth Street area. Well, no. Oh, when you, sorry. We, we take six and twenty-four from Pine, uh, Laurel out to Devereaux. So, from my understanding, um, a, there was a lot of conversation specifically within the work sessions and through PNZ that that was originally part of it, um, but there was direction to shrink that down significantly. Um, because at one point this included all a huge portion as well of the downtown core, including the confluence area. Um, so we have been staff has been moved into this smaller section um, due to constraints. Okay. So yes, I, uh, I do be... believe you are you are correct though that it was originally. Included. Okay, because I I think it, when when we shrank it, we were talking about being out like in the neighborhoods out the other side of City Hall in that area. Okay. Um, that's a little bit different than six and twenty four, which is already a fairly distinct commercial area and I think is ripe for redevelopment over the next 10 or 15 years. So I think we should be looking at that area. The, the second question I have is, it maybe I, and I, when you went through it, I was trying to make sure I followed it and, I, and reading it, I was trying to understand it. If I have a residential building and I tear it down and I'm gonna build a new building, and it's gonna be commercial, it's not subject to this? So if you are, if you demo a residential building and then you decide to move forward with commercial, it would be subject to okay. that. All right. That's um, but if you demoed a residential and then you put residential, no. not subject. Yeah. Okay. There was the first one. Yeah. I, I yeah. Thought, so I it, it's confusing. Sorry if I flew this pretty quickly. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's my question. Uh, Paula. Danielle, you listed like what, um, mm -hmm. what could be included. Um, and I noticed that we have motels, hotels. Does that also include um, short-term rentals? Yes. Okay. Yes. I uh, just want to make sure of that. And then when this came up the last couple of times, I still have my original packet stuff. <laughs> um, I brought up that putting all the parking in the back, which I don't have a problem with, but the access in the alleys is going to get really difficult. Have they started to look at possible solutions or how we'd accommodate that? Because that's going to be a lot of street money. Absolutely. So one of the things, and I was, I just want to go through the um, boundary really fast. So really when it comes into the parking conversation, it would impact more of the sixth street area because currently in the downtown area, there's no parking required today. Okay. So whenever we're focusing on that, the really major impact when we're talking about that access would be in that sixth street. Um, and again, I think your concerns are really are still valid and we'll definitely be looking at that as we move forward if we wanna focus this as an ordinance. So again, I would definitely say this is still at that high level stage of really understanding of getting into the nuances as we kind of move forward, if, if we want to move forward. And, and I brought it up because A and B's parking caused concern that it took up so much street space. And we don't know if a building gets demolished that they might look at parking like that again. And Emory, let me know if this is incorrect. So if, I think this, there's a really good, when it comes to the parking standards, if, although there's parking is not required, but let's say a business, you know, demos and they decide to put parking there, this would require them to put that parking in the rear. Not necessarily saying you are required to have the parking, but if you do, this is how it has to be formed. Right. So that that is a kind of a nuanced thing that we would have to dive deeper into, especially when we're talking about alleyway access. That and that would be yep. concerning again. Okay, thank you. Shelly. Thanks, Danielle. I have a couple of questions, but also comments. Are we doing both let's, right let's now? Let's do questions first. We're just doing questions. Okay. Um, so as I understand it, what are the goals of this? Because it I I read some, a lot of it seems geared towards tax revenue, but a lot of it seems geared towards activation. So, so have we defined our actual goals? No, that is a really good <laughs> question and definitely something that staff really wants to make clear that these goals and especially direction from PNZ that this is about vibrancy. So one of the things um, that we did talk about, and I forget if it was in the last work session or maybe the one before, is defining we want to identify the uses 
or do we want to identify uses by if they are sales tax or lodging? So we could, I don't want to necessarily use the word uh, cherry pick, but in that sense where you could almost pick the uses versus just making more of a blanket statement. So as of right now, and I think that's an important distinction, although it's being read that way, it doesn't mean it has to move forward. And the ultimate goal is that vibrancy and street activation. Okay. Is um, So we went from that at one point, we were looking at a really large boundary mm -hmm. all the way over to Vogelar and, yep. and back. And now we've shrunk it down to it's even smaller than the GID, or it's basically the GID and some of the north one. So I think a lot of the comments from earlier were specifically, especially the residential comments, were about that larger boundary. Have you guys looked at having two sets of kind of boundaries and having maybe an overlay for that core downtown? Um, and then it might be different regulations for a, a larger boundary for the downtown kind of residential commercial areas. So uh, just a thought. If, if um, we haven't I, internally, we haven't talked about that too much of having because I because just so I understand the the question, it's having this and then maybe something a little bit more expanded, but. Right. These kind of different regulations, but the intent being still the same. Yes. Kind so of the same we haven't talked too much about that. I okay. think um, if that's a direction that council wants us to look at, I'm sure we could absolutely move in that direction of kind of having two separate. Um, but okay. as of right now, this is definitely the only overlay that we have looked at and nothing expanded as of, as of today. Okay. And then back to that slide where it talks about uses mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. the first floor. Is that, um, so if somebody had short-term rental unit, that would be allowed on the first floor? Yes. Does that you, oh. add vibrancy? I, I guess it's a question <laughs> for council. Does that add vibrancy on the first floor level? I could see on subsequent floors. That's a great question okay. for council. <laughs> and then my question. final question is, is, um, have you looked at doing anything to encourage mixed use as so, re, as these buildings are redeveloped or? As of right now, I do not believe so. Emery, do okay. you have anything to add when it comes into the design standards? Or, um, or well, design? so I was just going to add, because the thing about the short term rentals is that, so they submit lodging tax, so they would fulfill that particular part, um, not taking Again, so this is an overlay district that we're proposing. So it's already existing in code are the downtown design standards, which for mixed use building already encourage commercial use on the first floor. And okay. so that's that addresses that part. Is so when you have a mixed use building already, regardless of whether this where this goes, that's already there. But commercial use can include things that have sales tax and do not have sales tax. Okay. So Okay, thank you. Marco and then Ingrid. Cool. Thanks, Danielle. Um, I, I seem to be missing a few things sure. and, and I just need to go over this one more time. Um, one of my first workshops I attended as a counselor was actually this subject. And, and somehow I recollect that we had talked about a larger area that time and 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 I think I we even talked about streets and how far and this and that so I'm a little bit surprised that it went back down to the smaller area so I don't know what happened in Pre the process uh, that was presented at that time the DDA map was presented at that workshop but we still talked about enlarging that area now we're back down to where it started so yeah i i think there wasn't clear consensus amongst the seven of you mm -hmm. and so i think if you would like to make it larger and four of you want to make it larger that that's great um but i i recall that too but um i know you were very passionate about the boundaries some other folks are very passionate about them not being that large at the time so at what point do we make it larger well tonight after we open up for public oh, comment. Yeah, okay yeah. excellent yeah. one thing the second thing was i thought not just new construction, but remodels as well. Trigger this, trigger this overlay. So great point. Um, one of the things that whenever we, especially moving forward into this, there's a lot of, to be honest, nuances when it comes to demo versus reno. Um, and that's something that we're gonna have to dive deeper into um, to really help define that. And 
keeping it blanket as of right now, I think it absolutely could impact that, but it's just going to have to be in one of those more specific ordinances of how we address that. But right. if that is the direction, I think we could absolutely do that. Okay. That hasn't been, I guess, removed, I guess, is my point of what I'm trying to say here. So, so what you're saying is that details will come later. Yes. Once, for, especially okay, once for we get there, something like that, because we define that differently in the code. Okay. And then a clarification on tearing down residential and building commercial residential. Mm -hmm. If I have a whatever sixplex, whatever, I tear it down, I build another modern sixplex and I'm going to rent it out or for sale. I don't have to put commercial in on the bottom. Correct. For the only way that that would have to shift is, for example, if that sixplex gets, you know, remod or, you know, removed, demoed, and then you decide to do mixed use. And then 10 years Got later, it. you demo it, it has to stay as that commercial mixed use. So that's the only way for it to be triggered into staying that way. But if residential to residential demo, it would not impact. So so as an example, mm -hmm. the Western Hotel, which was residential, and they're rebuilding it as residential, this would not apply to them. Since they are a motel. Well, it's, oh. it's going to be apartments. So that's, a different use. so that's, that's tricky because they probably were commercial at one point because it used to be a hotel. So they would be required. As of today, it's no, no oh, with sorry. this new overlay. Yes. Okay. Just so I get the, no, the, the, it's, the process. It's, it's complex. <laughs> right. And then the, the last thing was about the hotels. Um, I thought we talked about hotels are fine as long as there's a commercial component on the ground floor. So if you do build a hotel, you have to put shops in there for 75% of it. No. No, because I thought we included that. Yep. We 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 can we okay. comes back. Okay. I'm just asking no, did I, we or did we not? That's all. I think she's presenting that we she would we didn't have consensus. Okay, I got it. At that time. But I think tonight no, maybe thought what I say goes. No, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> as of right now, where it stands today oh, is <laughs> sales and lodging tax. So it, it that 75% would include motels and anything that would have lodging tax. Yeah. Okay. Th thank you, Danielle. Thank you. Thank you. Council Wusa. I'm going to, it's not a comment. Um, when we did the short-term rental moratorium, we had kind of an artificial stimulant that created a lot of permitting of short-term rentals. And my hesitation, knowing that there's quite a few vacant spots in downtown and maybe some people who have tentative plans, how does that work for approval of building or a business, I guess it would be like a business license um, in this interim? We we put this out here. I'm I'm fearful that people will apply. How does that, how, would you know how that would work? Do you monitor short-term rentals? And well, I mean, you're talking like businesses. Yeah. Like business wanting mm -hmm. to enter. I would think that, I mean, this would have an effective date. Mm -hmm. If someone has submitted a complete application, complete yeah. business license application yeah. prior to the effective date, I think it would have to be honored that way. Yeah, uh, I imagine what we take a look at is both um, if permit uh, either a you know a tenant finished permit had been pulled um, or a business license had been mm -hmm. applied for prior to the effective date of the ordinance. Okay. I don't think we're um, suggesting that this ordinance be you know an emergency ordinance or anything like that. So uh, yeah, um, I, I you know I think you might have a couple of things, but I think we try to honor the work that's um, ongoing currently. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and also to add to that, again, this is about new buildings. So mm -hmm. if you had an existing building and someone wanted to change out the business, this doesn't apply. So it'd sure. be like if you were had a vacant lot and you were going to try to get the building permit in and have a business. I mean, it would be, again, it's new development. So, it, But it also would apply to current. So say that there's an older building in the downtown core and the tenant moves out um, and a salon or a spa wants to move in this would prohibit that, correct? Is it a new, is it a brand new building? It, it's not a new, but, but see, that's what we're I, looking yeah, at. Yeah, I think that, I think one of the things we need to have a conversation about is change in use and current, 
Right. And, and I think this. you guys wanted it to apply not just to new, but to yeah. new. I think when you guys use the term new, you mean a new business moving into a space. New business. Not new building, yeah. Not new building. So well, this is going to apply right. to like four things in 20 years. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And <laughs> and so yeah. I think the answer to the question is the one that I gave you, that if there was a currently pending yeah, okay. permit or okay. if there was a pending business license or something, we would honor that, Great. recognizing what's going on. Mm -hmm. It also gave clarity to the fact that I think many of us up here or want to see this um, apply to new businesses and, and businesses within this corridor. Yeah. So, oh, hold on. There we go. go ahead. Thank you. Maybe this is a question for Ingrid. <laughs> so a salon's not included in the 75% when somebody opens a salon, they've got to then also open something else. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I think that, I think the, the goal, as I understand it, is that you're trying to move away from certain types of businesses to encourage that sort of retail establishments, um, you know, minimize the number of real estate offices, attorney's offices. Um, Not that there's anything wrong with either one of those, by the way. <laughs> At least one. Well, right. Uh, <laughs> sure. um, and, and as a result, um, on that ground floor, um, consciously have a mix that, that you guys are looking for to, for a vibrant downtown. So some business types would not fit in. I understand that. I'm just saying, if I had opening a salon, there's no way I could open another business too. <laughs> well, no. What I'm what I'm saying is, is that you wouldn't be opening the salon if if you had one that was opening mm -hmm. now. You'd open your salon, you would be fine. When that use changed, it would need to match the new regulations. So it's not going to force a current operating business to change. I understand it. that it doesn't force a current. I'm just yeah. saying that if somebody came in and said, "I'm buying." Um, Bullocks, and I want to make it a salon, which would be a huge salon. That they'd all have to accommodate another business within that business, yeah. right? If the regulations go into effect, that's absolutely right. Yeah, um, that's that's. But that's you would probably thing. select a different space then for your salon. This is true. Building. So if no, you went, wait, no. No. set that aside. <laughs> it's not what these guys want. We're talking about something totally different. We'll have to redraft a little bit. That's okay because I. I understand what you guys We're are. just talking business to business. So if I yeah. King's business Harbor business shop for, yeah. from years and years ago, the guy sh shuts it down. I go in, I want to open a little tiny salon. Then right. I have to the, do you, a salon you, and something yeah. else. Right. You could sell some braces. Race. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I think that it, it's very hard. There's a lot of like potential kind of like those mixed what ifs. Um, but the goal being is that it's to shift the ground floor within whatever boundary you guys set to moving towards less non kind of activated tax generating businesses. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, a couple of government questions. <laughs> uh, so did you cover major remodels? Did I miss that? What, what, what about major remodels? So as of right now, it's really uh, that, Kind of what I was mentioning earlier, it's going to have to be something that we would have to define as we move forward with this ordinance because we separate all of those within the code. Um, as of, you know, based upon direction, if that's something that we'd want to make sure that it's included, definitely. Um, I don't think that's something internally for that staff has separated as of right now. Okay. And the other thing I have is, is a question is a vacant lot. Um, you know, say oh, if you wanted to put like, a Volvo dealership or something like that on a lot. But I guess what I'm saying is like residential, if there's a vacant residential lot, you know, something that has like not tree canopy, something that's nice and hooded. What, why wouldn't we want to have retail on a vacant lot? Like you said, vacant lots wouldn't necessarily be. So for, for that, it's um, not necessarily that vacant lots wouldn't be included. It's the fact that if, uh, for example, the DDA lot um, mm -hmm. for where mama progies is for if, someone wanted to develop that into all residential that wouldn't get impacted so that's the separation here um but that's something that could change based upon tonight's direction so. <laughs> okay <laughs> there's no under uh you know internal staff conversation when it comes to that either and i think the reason 
just for some additional background, the only reason that that has been really pulled out specifically is because there was a lot of concern as this would be detracting for residential units. And so that has been a the purpose on outlining of kind of pulling out anything residential to continuously being allowing development that we're not disincentivizing. So just for some general context around that and why. Right. Yeah, I just want to be transparent. Yep, I don't want absolutely. to be, you know, so we all know what's going on, you know, nothing shrouded, nothing hooded. Um, okay, any other uh, questions for staff? <clears throat> nope, okay. Um, this is a ordinance, right? Public hearing. Public hearing, yeah. So anybody from the public like to speak on this? Be nobody in the immediate audience. Is there uh, Mr. McGregor? He was here in the one Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, seeing no one, uh, we'll close public comment and bring it back for comments and discussion. Uh, Charlie, then Shelley. So, as I understand this, Danielle, we're looking. Oh, there, there you went. We're you're looking for how we should next present this and get and actually get public input. Yes. Um, based upon the last work session, uh, council directed staff to move forward of how to best communicate with the public about this and council directed to have a public meeting with council. So really we're asking for is, is there something, well, one, making sure that is this what we want to present? And second, how best to approach that and also some availability for council of when, when would be the best time to do something like that? Um, and if there's anything that's really specific, we want feedback throughout this, you know, if there's something we should focus on or just all of it, um, that's, that's really what we're looking for tonight. Okay, so my comment on that is, is twofold, I guess. One is I think, yeah, we should have a general public discussion. I, I'm not a great believer in this case that having boards and walking around and doing that kind of stuff is effective. I think it ought to be where it's a presentation, either here, community center, where we're, we're sitting at the table, listening to people, their concerns about this. And in that regard, I think we also need to make sure that we get out to all the areas that might be included in this overlay and give them a hand, make sure that the owners get a mailing and the and the shop owners that are in there, if they're not at the tenants, I'm sorry, that's what I'm looking for. Um, they also get notice. Um, I think we should encourage them to come and give us input because you heard a bunch of ideas here, but I certainly would like to know what this affected area thinks about these things. Um, and, and then we have to make a decision based on that and what's good for the city, what we want to give staff further direction as far as developing an ordinance. Shelly. Completely agree that- Hold on, hold on, so push your button again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I agree with what Charlie said, that outreach is really important. And I want to hear from our locals that live around that area, live downtown. And um, I guess that's one of my main comments, too, is I think maybe there's a little bit of since that boundary changed. When we had, when council gave all those comments about residential and we don't want to lose residential, we were looking at a boundary that included several blocks of the downtown residential area. Those comments and my understanding, and I won't speak for, for everyone, but those were, were geared towards those areas, not necessarily with this very slim boundary now. That's a, a commercial region, you know, commercial blocks. It's our core downtown. We don't have a lot of residential down there. There's a couple I can think of that might get redeveloped. And that's my point on those. In that case, in that very distinct core downtown, it's likely we want to encourage those. For example, I think there's a couple of single family type dwellings down there. If those are going to be demolished and re, um, developed. redeveloped, <laughs> thank you. Couldn't find that word. Um, we want to encourage possibly a mixed use to where it would be a taller building. It would maximize the lot in the downtown. It could bring in revitalization in the form of maybe some commercial on the first floor, but then residential above that, more density downtown. And um, I'm very interested in seeing these 
some new regulations work for our locals downtown. I think we bring vibrancy to downtown by having our locals live there, not just designing it for tourists. So I really question allowing VRVOs on the first floor. I don't think that may bring in some tax revenue, but it does not add vibrancy to that first floor level downtown. Um, you know, I put that in the in the same category as having an office. At the same time, I wouldn't mind seeing a barbershop. You know, again, you're serving locals um, and that could bring vibrancy, one that also sells product and stuff like that. So I think we, we need to have a lot of discussion around what are our goals here and how do we define that vibrancy and what do we wanna see? How do we make our downtown work for the locals? So that's what I'm interested in. As far as how we do that, I'd love to see us um, outreach again to people who live there, the businesses downtown, the, the neighborhoods have some charrettes, you know, bring people in, let them have some free space to work on ideas, you know, beyond just maybe dots. The dots are helpful sometimes, but also just let them get creative on ideas too. Um, let's see. I think that's all I have for now. Thanks. Thanks, Shelley. Ingrid? When this was originally proposed, it was huge. It was a, a much larger and, and a little intimidating. It did take up our housing stock. Now it's gone too small. So I think what we need to do is before we all come back together, I think the general consensus is we want this to be activated. We don't want a downtown that ends up with the DMV in one of the building or one of the, the stores. Um, so with that in mind, I think we, we know what we want, but I think we need to fine tune. And before we really fine tune, we need to get public comment. So next steps to give you guys direction is get some time scheduled. Um, we trust you guys to find opportunity to really connect in particular with this core. I think Jillian would be a great resource as well to connecting with a lot of those businesses. Um, and then come back to us with that feedback, schedule a work session. We can do the work session again. And then later that evening, I think we could probably dial this in then. And I'd like to do it this spring, ideally. That's kind of my preference. Paula. Thanks, Ingrid. Paula, mic on. Mic on. Okay, we're still ready. Okay. Um, I'm not sure we have complete consensus here on the dais yet, but I do think it should go to the neighborhood. But the one thing I was just going to bring up is when this came up to us before, I don't know if it was the last one or the one before that, um, I had comments from the neighborhood that they had gotten something in the mail, but they didn't know what it was. So I think whatever we do has to have more clarity. Um, and when they were trying to describe it to me, it took me a while to figure out what they were talking about. I was like, no, we're talking about parking. No, it's not parking. I'm like, all right, what is it? So um, I, I like the idea of because we here are talking narrow boundary, wide boundary, what's the usage? It would be great to show those options just to get that feedback. Um, because as Carl said, we weren't in agreement the last time we had that discussion. So I'd rather have the neighborhood input. And my thoughts on the residential side of it is these people are in their small neighborhoods and they like their communities. They don't want to feel like that's going to get taken away from them. So we just, I think we need to appreciate that, um, especially when you're looking closer up towards the high school in that area, which I think originally those borders extended as big as into those neighborhoods. So um, some community feedback, as everybody said, I think is important. Councilor Dan. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go into a little more specific um, what I think should happen. I'm not too concerned how you present it, how we're going to get the feedback. You guys do this masterfully. You figure it out. No problem. Do it soon, though. That's the only thing I got. Um, other than that, I would say the area needs to increase. I was the one that brought you the large, large, large area. Yes, that was way too big because I knew you'd rein it in. I think we should include the GID. I think we should include we should include the GID. 
we need to include 6th Street up to 4th Street behind the hotel, straight across and include the 6th Highway 6 corridor to Devereux. To start, give the people options so they can see what it could mean. Not just the little one, not just the large one, but show a few options. Number one, second, what Shelley said with the mixed use, I think is fantastic. We should encourage that. Could also be presented in a way. Uh, the next thing is <laughs> vacant lots. I think that's that's part of why we're doing this. We don't want, we have one vacant lot, we have the DDA lot, which is not the DDA lot anymore, but it used to be. I don't want full residential there. I want animation on the bottom, which brings me to the uses. Nothing wrong with the salon. I think we should relook at the uses and say animation, not necessarily sales tax only. And the last one is for the hotel. Hotels are great. VRBOs, keep them, leave them out. I agree with this, but the hotel needs to provide retail space in the ground floor. And a hotel could be nicely placed in any of these areas I mentioned in my, in my boundary uh, layout. So I think that's all I have. If I think of something else, I'll let you know, but that's where I'm at. A little more specific. Thank you. Tony? Okay, um, I, I think vibrancy is what I would say. Sales tax is secondary. I mean, I like how like sales tax is a, a general catch-all to vibrancy. So that, that makes a lot of sense. But I think um, I totally get, Paula, your point about barbershops and, and all that, um, you know, being uh, something that is for the locals, brings people downtown. But, but really a barbershop's not that different than a, bank other than it produces some sales tax and so when i talk when i think about vibrancy i i look at a town like moab that you go there and it is it's right now it's seven o'clock in moab in the off season i bet every store is open 90 percent of the stores are open and it's hopping right now our town rolls up it's the carpet the retail establishments not the restaurants but the retail establishments all close it's, eh, with some exceptions uh hookers being one of them give a shout out to uh counselor davis former counselor davis but, you know, that vibrancy extending into the evening, I think, is something that a barbershop or a personal service does not provide. And so, you know, I think there's ways, I don't want everything to come back before this council. We have to set some rules. Um, to me, uh, hotels, vacation rentals on the ground floor, absolutely not. Um, that does not achieve what we're looking, do what we're trying to achieve, even though it does produce sales tax revenue. I would say personal service things, yoga studios, barbershops, things like that, that are typically not open for us as the general public and the tourist economy. I kind of lean a little bit away from that just personally, but if we wanted to have a special use permit where we could evaluate that, or um, maybe that would be, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of torn on the personal service side because if we want to encourage personal service or uh, vitality after five o'clock, that doesn't really do it for us. Um, I think I like the larger area um, rather than what we see up here. Um, I think going to Devereaux and encompassing that, you know, what I, we, I call uh, hotel row, you know, having the tourists be at the Hampton Inn, the Holiday Inn, and walking right now along 6th Street, is, it's really embarrassing. Um, you know, it, there's, it's weeds, it's vacant buildings that, you know, that the old Chomps building. Um, at least making it consistent with the Sixth Street Master Plan and our comp plan. And right now, if we if we were to expand this overlay to Devereaux, that would be consistent with both our Master Plan and the Sixth Street the Sixth Street Master Plan and our comp plan. Uh, so I'd, I'd hate to reel that in too far because I think that's a huge opportunity for this community. Um, and then, and I'm just throwing this out there. I, you know, I think. Um, I think we're designing a whole lot of stuff and we'll get down to designing percentages and all that, but I'd rather see something like an 80, 20, but then give people uh, a 10% credit per floor of housing. So if somebody wanted to do a three story, but put housing on the second floor and the third floor, maybe they get to be 75, 25, maybe they get to be 60, 40, you know, give them a carrot for providing housing. And I don't know, we can get into if some of it has to be affordable, we can get into, you know, what AMI it is. I don't know about that right now, but, you know, I think for your presentation and what, what I'd like to say is I think, yes, it needs to, I agree with everybody here who says it needs to go back out. 
But I think we need to, and I don't know if we've done it yet, but a majority of us need to coalesce around a little bit better of an idea. We don't need to nail down the, the percentages. We don't need to nail down the exact border, but we need to give enough direction to you to take out to the folks so that they can give feedback. Because right now, what you'd be giving us feedback on um, before this meeting probably wouldn't be super useful to us. So those are kind of my comments. You've heard some other comments that maybe conflict or not. Um, we have a couple. Oh, yes. One. And go ahead. Sorry. I'll let you ask that question because, uh, but you'll have to get in line. Did you have a? Oh, I was just going to say one of the things uh, at that original work session, you all wanted to be the ones leading this conversation with the community, as in you in a room and the community in the room with you. A uh, number of you, yeah, and I'm getting a lot of head mixed head nodding now on who goes where and where they fit in. So one of the important questions coming out of this that we need answered is, are you leading the conversation or are we taking something out to the public and just reporting back into you? You don't like just as you wrap this up, just keep that in mind. Um, I have Charlie, Paula, Marco, and just to answer that question, I would say you guys do a great job at this stuff. And when you put us into a room, you put me into the room, it's, it's not as good. I don't think we do as good a job as being subjectively hearing. So my, my suggestion would be you guys, Charlie, go ahead. Yeah. I didn't talk really about what the development would be more of the hearing process. And I disagree with the comment that, that that mayor just made. I think that we do need to be engaged in the public on a direct level. This is an important issue for this community. And this is where we, we're not listening. They say we don't listen because they don't see us at these functions. I go to most of these public openings, but you know, very honestly, there's not a lot of us that go to those as council members. And, and some people come in and they don't see me because I'm not there when they're there. I think we should be, whether we lead it or we're engaged in it. I guess I see us engaged in it. And I think coming up with some designs and the stuff that everyone's talking about, I, for the most part, I agree with uh, what Marco and others have said as far as uses and, and Jonathan. I think that the I got idea when we started this is we want that bottom floor to be retail. We want it, we want to do, we, we want to get that vibrancy going. And I think that was the idea of that. That's the, the model you see out there. You know, and the only other comment I'm making is, is, is I agree with Jonathan, it'd be nice not to have everybody close at five o'clock, but I've talked to a lot of shop owners over the last four or five years, and, and you know, I was on DDA and, and since I've been in council. And the problem with a lot of the shops right now is they're mom and pop operations. They show up at eight, nine o'clock in the morning, they get all ready, they open at 10 o'clock in the morning, they close at five or six at night, and, and they don't have the resources um, to hire people, and we don't have the people to hire as well to stay open later. I, that's a, a endemic problem we have to work on. I do think if we get more retail, that may have solve itself because we make enough activity, they can afford to hire people and do things like that. But I think we got to be careful with, with that. And, and I really would love to see stores open at eight or eight thirty at night. And, and there are shout out to Bullocks; they're also open almost every night, you know, uh, of the every day of the week. And Treads, I think those are the stores I see open at night a, a lot. So um, anyway, those are my comments. Thanks. Thanks, Charlie. Paula. Just one other comment, um, because of your comment on nighttime versus daytime vibrancy, I, I think both are important. And I also would say in that, that there's a balance. If I go downtown to go to the bank, to get my haircut, to, to run into downtown drug, to stop in at treads, because I was looking for, I do it all at once. So having personal salons, yoga, um, masseuse, um, there's a balance in providing those opportunities that lead people to downtown, that then they go do other things. So vibrancy is more than a tourist walking down the street and finding his cha-chas or taking home. It's like, you know, chotskis, mm -hmm. not cha-chas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Um, but you know what I meant. Mm -hmm. Um it, it's more than that, you know, it's, it's, it's vibrancy is us being down there as having lunch as right. It's, it's all of, it's everything, not just having another store there. Although I love our stores. And when I have visitors come with me, we all go downtown and we go shopping and they love it, you know, so it's, it's a good thing, but it's more than just having another retail store. Thank you. Marco, then Ingrid. 
I remember now, remodels. I think this should also pertain to remodels. doesn't matter what percentage you tear the, the existing down, but it should pertain to remodels. It does matter. Can I, can I ask a clarifying question? Yeah. Um, so when you're talking about a remodel, you're talking about a change of use and a remodel or a remodel. I have my, uh, my attorney's office down there and I pull a remodel permit. Um, are you telling me I have to break my lease and move out? No, absolutely. It's it's in conjunction with a change of use. Okay. It, it has to be, otherwise it's not right. right. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. that's. I just wanted to clarify that. No, I hear you. Thank you. And, and can I ask a question to that question? So, well, but not to get wrapped around the axle, but it's important for me to help understand. If you're moving out of your office and you're changing your specific lease and you're a, a, a law firm and another law firm wants to move in, would this apply to, is that a change of use, even though it's a, a law firm, law firm? No, I don't, I don't think it would be because it doesn't trigger a probably, I, we'll have to look at how we'd handle yeah. that to, to handle that. There's really not a lot change, like you wouldn't even know other than the sign out front changed. Right. Um, if there's no other remodel going on. Um, so we'll take a look at that because I don't have a good answer for you. Honestly. Yeah, I'm not trying to you know, no, pick a nit no, here. That's I just, what I mean. It's a good issue spotting, but it's just one that I don't, I, off yeah. the top of my head, I'm not exactly sure how we thread that needle. I mean, honestly, what we're doing is pretty forward leaning into things. I don't know. There's a whole lot of examples like this. And Daniel, you, you have done a really good job so far with this. So there, as of right now, there aren't um, a whole lot of examples. Um, so this would definitely be, you know, kind of pioneering the way a little bit uh, for kind of moving forward in this direction. Thanks. Ingrid, then Tony. Hold on. Okay, I think for me, I need to look at kind of where the origin of this was. And it really started, the dialogue started when I was on planning and zoning, when the bank, the A and B bank came in and displaced businesses. And the challenge with the way we have structured the, the, the downtown is that there's not a significant amount of commercial locations for these businesses. Knowing that 70% of our tax revenue comes from tourism, supporting them, while still creating you know, the infrastructure for all of us to live here and have dry cleaners and salons is important, but I can take a salon and I can put it somewhere else in the town and they still have the ability to be successful in that location. Whereas if I am selling clothes and, you know, tchotchkes, <laughs> I'm, I am limited. I have a limited area where I can be successful. And so that was, for me, that was the impetus behind this, like supporting this dialogue and moving forward with this. I, I don't want to see salons. I don't want to see something where one person could walk in every hour. I want a place with, that's vibrant, that people are constantly on a busy Friday afternoon or, you know, summer day. People are coming in and out constantly. Can, can I say something? I think yeah. to this point is that 75% and 25% allow for that salon yeah. if at the a and b bank or a and b that that previous thing had seven retailers in there yeah in theory four square footage wise because salons are smaller mm -hmm. you could have had two salons oh. and still had the vibrancy of, of everything else so, so there's a, i don't think it's either or i i agree with you but i think that what has happened and you if you talk to somebody who's been displaced from their business in the downtown core they struggle to find a place to move it. And it can be a thriving business that maybe the, the building sells, or maybe, you know, there's some other, maybe the, the rent goes up. I want the businesses that are here to have stability. And, and it may be that occasionally they do need to move. And I want them to have more, more options available. We, and I know we have put some buffers on the marijuana stores, but we lost a lot of commercial real estate in great locations that to that industry. And so once again, you know, it means that there's even a, a smaller amount for these businesses to go to. And they're the businesses there. We got a letter from, from a business here in downtown. Those are the businesses that make that thriving downtown that your friends and family want to go to. Mm -hmm. Your family doesn't come here to get there. You know, you guys don't go downtown to, to go to the barber salon. And I'm not discounting. Once again, right. we can find balance within this downtown footprint. That's my concerns. Thank you, Ingrid. Councilor Hershey. 
you know, we can't change the basic economics and the economic shifts. What did they used to say in Boulder, Mr. Mayor, about Volvo drivers? Like, you want you get the Volvo crowd? Yeah, yeah, the Volvo crowd, yeah. Yeah. Is that what you're looking for? What are you looking for? And how is this council going? I mean, we keep talking about, I can't, I can't believe I keep hearing barbershop and barbershops. I mean, is this like Andy Griffith? Because that <laughs> world is gone. I, I don't know where, what we're talking about. I think you have to let the economics drive it. I agree with Ingrid about, you know, the marijuana stores and driving out certain retail. Remember the little jewelry store down here under the Japanese restaurant? Now they're upstairs in near Tom Silverman. Mm -hmm in that building, the bank building? Why are they on the third? How is a jewelry store? I don't know. It was so hard to find them. So that that kind of change worries me. I'm just concerned that we're going to try to insert our sort of vision of, and I say Mayor Mayberry, you know, uh, mm -hmm. let's go down to the barbershop and we'll hang out and then we'll go to the general store. That just doesn't exist anymore. It's a different way people shop. We have the mall out at the meadows where people go. I just don't know what we're trying to do. So I would be careful of unintended consequences like the Volvo drivers. Right. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, any other comments, questions? I just don't want to be a community where Mark Hunt shuts down all of our businesses and we have vacant storefronts everywhere. So can you just do that? <laughs> <You're right>. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, so what what is action? This is an ordinance. We don't have to pass any. We, no. we can't really. Um, uh, the only thing you need to do, I think we've gotten a lot of good feedback. I'm going to jump in a little bit and refocus you on how do you want this public engagement process to go? There's clearly two different versions up there. Um, it would be much appreciated if you'd sort that out. Marco. I would let the professionals do their professional stuff, but I want to be allowed to come. Shelly, uh, oh, you, you, no, so when you do it, I do it and just don't touch it. Just don't, you don't have to do anything. So until he, okay. there. Retrain. <laughs> <laughs> I think you all too can come up with a great way to do it. I, the only thing I would say is this is focusing on the actual regulations on what we might put in the place. Is, is maybe not the purview it, as much of the public. I think it's more focusing on the vision of what do they want to see downtown. And then we can craft regulation to kind of work towards that. So I think a bit of education for the public and then getting feedback on, you know, what are the, what are the neighborhoods and the businesses want to see our downtown be? And I would focus it more on on our locals, on the people who live here. Charlie. And I hate to repeat this because I think I'm losing this battle, but I'm going to say it anyway. We need to be engaged. We need to be engaged as a council. This is a huge change in the way, and, and Tony hit it. I mean, it's a huge way change the way we're going to ask people to do business in this community. And I think we need to be engaged in that process. Um, and I, I don't want to see this be a community center where 15 people show up and nobody else shows up. I think it ought to be in this room, it ought to be highly publicized, you know, maybe diagrams, things like that, that so people know we're talking about. And we should be here engaging. They should hear us having this discussion. We should engage in a, in a discussion. It isn't, it doesn't have to be formalized like a meeting, but it has to be engaged in a discussion. I, I just think if we go out and do these, I'm sorry, I'm really losing my patients with storyboards. And I know that's a way of doing things, but I just go to these things and I, I went to a transportation one uh, three or three weeks or so ago up in, in the library uh, in the community center. I'm sorry, I forgot the name of it, um, Mortgage Commons. And, and I sat there the entire time and I thought they had these little groups, which was great, but we had no conversation going on about what people wanted. And that's what I'm missing. And then people say, I'm not listening because I come up here because I think I've heard things that I wasn't at, or I got these storyboards and I didn't get a chance to engage. So I, I just don't get, we got to change the process. We do it. Paula. Thanks, Charlie. Um, I, along Charlie's line, I, I like to be engaged. So, um, at some level where we can have discussion with people while they're talking. Um, I usually go to these things that I can get to and um, I end up talking to a half a dozen people to a dozen people and I think that's where I hear things more. I mean, it's great to have this, okay, we got some 
bullet points that we you took back and brought to us because I don't remember everything and I don't see everybody, but community engagement is really important to me. Yeah, I'd say community engagement is absolutely fundamentally important, but I think the community also needs to understand what this council wants and what P and Z wants and what we're trying to achieve. And that's where I think we have the leadership role of saying, here's what we're trying to do. Here's what we're trying to achieve. Here's a lot of ideas we've talked about. We need to set the guardrails because just talking to a group of average citizens who are not engaged, who are not here tonight, who haven't been a part of this conversation, this is going to be so, they're going to try to recreate the wheel. They're going to try to reinvent everything. But if we can give them, and I think you have some pretty good guidelines and some pretty good ideas on size, on uses, personal service, like what is those things? I think those are the fundamental questions I'd like feedback on. But just saying to the general public, give us more vibrancy in downtown. Like we, you guys have done way too much work. p and has done too much work. And now we have done too much work, I think, to just open up the floodgates and say, just give us feedback. We need feedback on certain questions about what we've asked tonight, I think. So. All right. Thank you. Everyone's good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I know it's a lot of work. <laughs> Hannah, I'll be back to Hannah. <laughs> go to the tape again, like those commercials. You go back. <laughs> All right. Item number eleven. The second item. Mr. McGregor wants to come. How to amendment to municipal code uh, 07045 committee housing standards and guidelines, including but not limited to inclusionary zoning standards. This is the second reading. And being the second reading, I don't know we need a huge presentation, but you're welcome to give us the short one. Well, I'm good at doing short. Okay. <laughs> um, so as you all know, we're, we're here today to talk about potential changes to the inclusionary zoning requirements, uh, which are requirements that are found in Title 70, Section 5 of the Municipal Code. Uh, these proposed changes were initiated at the direction of the Council, I believe, in October and have been reviewed both by the Housing Commission and Planning Commission. Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, as you all know, inclusionary zoning requirements are kind of baked in affordability requirements. They are one of the tools for increasing the supply of affordable housing in the city. The city's had inclusionary zoning requirements. They had We had them from 2001 to 2017, although I believe they were suspended in 2011. Um, and then the current requirements were, were enacted in 2021. Uh, and inclusionary zoning requirements are common in many jurisdictions in Colorado and I believe in the nation as well. Um, we had some discussion in the first reading about projects. Um, do you have a comment there? Just maybe speak up a little bit. Oh, sure. Thanks. I can get closer to the microphone too. Um, so we had some discussion at the first reading about uh, projects that, that have been uh, subject to the inclusionary zoning requirements since they were enacted. And I just wanted to give you all a little bit more information. So here you can see the presentation. Uh, there have been four projects that have come through the process. Uh, since they since the requirements were enacted, obviously this only uh, has effect on residential projects. So since 2021, these four projects have come in, um, and I'm happy to come back to this or highlight any specific information you need to have. Are you? We can't see it. Yeah, we can't see. I that. Can't see it. Okay, let's do that. <laughs> I mean, looking at the screen. It's fantastic. I see something. I see Terry. Um, <laughs> Terry's that new hairstyle. Share screen. Share screen. Yeah. Right in the middle. I'm sorry. No, you're all okay. It's fine. Can you see it now? Nope. Yeah. Okay. We're good. So, uh, in terms of the real estate outlook for residential prices um, for 2022, the condo, the median condo purchase price in Glenwood was about $530,000. Uh, you can contrast that to what we've calculated is affordable for a family of four that's at the B area median income, um, which is about $377,000. So that's, you know, $150,000 gap or something like that. 
Um, rental costs are a little bit harder to pin down because rental leases aren't recorded in the public record, but we do believe that uh, rental prices have been going up and are pricing out many people. So here briefly uh, is some of the code language that is proposed to be changed. Um, the applicability from uh, 10 units to five units, the threshold at which the inclusionary zoning requirements would take effect. And here we see the percentage change that's proposed to be changed from 10% of units to 20% for the cost affordability uh, the deed restricted units requirement. And here we had some good discussion at the first reading about what actual change this would be and looking at examples. Uh, and so I took a risk of throwing some, some numbers at you all. Um, and we can skip over this or go into detail as you all wish. Um, but on the far left column, we have um, hypothetical unit numbers for a residential project. Um, we have resident occupied current uh, requirements, which are not what we're not discussing tonight. Then we have the deed restriction under current requirements. So these are in that column is the number of units that would be created under the current requirements with this number of units. Then to the right of that, we have the number of affordability, uh, affordable housing units that would be created under the proposed requirements. And finally, to the right of that is the difference between them. So going back to the four projects that have gone through the process since 2021, you can see that there's a difference of about 10 units uh, between the current proposal and what is on the books right now. So to summarize what you all's options are tonight, uh, you could continue this to another meeting. You could uh, reject any changes or you could approve some change to the current requirements. Here are the criteria of approval that I won't read to you all. There are five criteria that uh, need to be met with a finding. And I'll take any questions that you all have. So is this second reading we've asked a lot of questions of staff the first reading that, and, and we don't need to take it to public comment although no. we will yes we don't oh, we will yes yes i understand but but legally we've already taken it to public council so we don't have to but we're going to just getting through the, the the verbatim so do we have questions additional questions right now staff before we open public comment okay uh anybody in the audience like to speak yes sir Say my piece and get out. But. <laughs> you can stay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm. Uh, I pretty much know everyone except for you, Mr. Dean. But uh, my name is Dave Rippey. I am from Glenwood. Lived here all my life. Um, and I don't envy what you're trying to undertake. I mean, affordable housing in this town is a tough one. I mean, we all know that it's it's really tough. As an employer in my construction company, my excavation company, mm -hmm. I have a hard time getting people. If they I drop from as far away as Parachute. Um, that being said as an also developer and i've done right around 70 units up and down the valley in multiple configurations duplexes fourplexes sixplexes um you got a problem with dropping these you know when you when you get a large project 20 percent works at and i haven't counted it out above 10 but at 10 units requiring 20 percent affordability you got a problem. That problem is the math doesn't work. You know, and just being straight up with you as a developer, you, you can't ship spread the cost of that affordability through the whole project. If you're doing 40 units, you can spread it out. And, and, and it can be done. Um, I can tell you, if you had this requirement now, you wouldn't have Bennett Court townhomes. You wouldn't have the mountain market edition. You wouldn't have 805 Blake, all of which I've built, all of which would be subject to this. And you would lose like 20 units right there. I mean, the, the numbers just don't work. Um, the other thing this is going to do because of that is eliminate an entire class of housing. And that's the small sixplex, anything under a 10 unit. Yeah, I mean, anything under 10 units is not is not going to be able to be built. The small infill projects you're eliminating. And that's gonna force bigger projects. And you all saw what happened with out on Donegan. People don't like the bigger projects. Um, the other thing this is gonna do because of that is increase traffic. 
I mean, the traffic's a problem in Glenwood, but if you do this and eliminate the infill and the smaller projects, it's going to keep putting pressure down Valley and the people are going to have to move up. Um, like I say, I, I don't, I don't envy you with this. I don't have the answer, but I can be straight up with you. If I, if this goes, I won't be building in Glenwood because this is right in my niche. I mean, this is right where I build. And, and it, the numbers, it's just not the risk. You know, the, the potential reward doesn't equate with the risk. So, and I've also talked to three other friends of mine that do the same thing and then they're not coming, but same, same, exact same response. So anyhow, good luck. Thanks very much. Um, I hope you find the answer. Thanks so much, Dave. Dave. No. no. Watkins? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, it's, it's public comment right now. So yeah, can comment. we finish public comment? Okay. okay. Uh, anybody else? Two online. Two online. Okay. I forget Mr. McGregor. I believe he's the one <laughs> online. Is that Scottish? Three online. Okay. So, uh, whoever. Mr. McGregor. Uh, thanks very much. And sorry for trying to jump in earlier. But yeah, I just wanted to. Uh, echo what Mr. Rippey's saying, except um, the effect extends to bigger projects as well. And uh, really the rule of unintended consequences, it's, it's easy to imagine you're gonna get twice the units. I put it to you that the chilling effect of this um, is that you won't see very many units at all. Um, there are those sitting uh, up in council now who remember the history of uh, affordable housing requirements before and uh, in a decade less than 10 units were delivered we actually uh, contributed to more than half of those with Pete Waller and the history of those is a lot of those have been undone it's exceedingly difficult at 10 percent I think it's dead in the water at 20 percent um, Glenwood's difficult to develop in and obviously I base this on uh, 18 years of entitlements and 24 years of owning land um, in West Glenwood. Um, we don't sit on it and pay the taxes just because we're holding back. Uh, we wait for the opportunity for it to make economic sense. That just means a reasonable return. And of course, it's become more difficult recently um, to make that return as engineered by the feds. So I do think the consequence is pretty clear that um, there will be uh, very few single family homes built. And um, whilst I understand the, the backlash against uh, rental units, I think it would be exceedingly prudent to try and uh, incentivize for sale by at the very least differentiating. Um, I also think more areas could be explored like granting credits for people who can bring affordable housing developments of scale. So for instance, if somebody could bring 100 affordable housing units to Glenwood, maybe they could get a credit for 50 units, something like that. So I think there are more creative ways to do it. I think 20% uh, is almost certainly a, um, a stop everything type deal. And uh, the only place I disagree with Mr. Rippey is that uh, it extends to bigger projects because the simple math is that uh, under the proposed ordinance, four people have to pay for the fifth. You're widening, widening the social disparity. You're having to charge more. There isn't some um, happy money tree that can be shaken here. It's a transfer from one future citizen to another. And um, I don't think you'll see the stuff get built. So um, it's, it's late in the day. It's a second reading and all the rest of it. But given that uh, it was quite a close issue last time, uh, I felt the need to speak up and would certainly be happy to work uh, you know, with staff, many many of whom don't really remember the, the history, but there are people who do. That, Mr. McGregor, uh, uh, thank, your, you. your thank you. <laughs> thank you. We don't, we don't have the time. I appreciate your comments, Mr. McGregor. I, I do understand. Uh, thank you for listening. <laughs> Okay. Uh, absolutely. And just for uh, Mr. West and, and Mrs. Gold, uh, Gould, excuse me, uh, I'll just give you a heads up. Hey, we're at the three minutes. So if you could uh, wrap your comments up, because it looks like we don't have the clock. Oh, there we go. There's a clock.
Oh, so they can see it. Okay, cool. Good job, team. Uh, Good Ms. Job, team. Mr. West. Or Mrs. Gould. I don't know. I can't tell. Hey there. This is Ben. Hi, Ben. Hi. Uh, I don't really have too much different to say, but, you know, as a, as a developer in Glenwood and somebody that's, you know, um, I, I, I certainly think that figuring out affordable housing is a big deal. And obviously the residents have spoken and we, we brought 2C on board and, uh, you know, people understand the need. Everyone does. Um, the development is already expensive and risky and difficult. Glenwood's a tough place to a tough place to try and make it happen, but trying to shift the burden of the cost onto the people, just like Mr. McGregor was saying, uh, onto the people that are paying for the other unit, you know, it, it, it's not really the right way to do it. Um, I think there's a lot of other ways to look at doing this, but we need to, I, I would highly encourage not, in, not passing this or not increasing the the requirement for inclusionary housing because it's just going to make development even more difficult in the city and the economics really aren't going to work. And, and I, you know, like Mr. McGregor said, you know, it, and uh, it's not, it, it's not going to work on a big scale or a small scale project because the numbers are super tight as it is. And I think if anything, we should try and figure out, spend our, spend our time trying to figure out ways to get to incentivize developers to come build affordable housing in Glenwood and not try to place more regulation on how it's done. So again, I'm, I'm super happy to help as well. But, uh, I, I don't think that increasing the need for or the, the threshold for inclusionary housing is gonna help. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. Are, are you done? Sorry. I'm done. Okay. I'm good. <laughs> Felt like there's a natural pause. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Ms. Gould, I, I don't want to be. Uh, hi, Council. This is Mark Gould Jr. Sorry for the confusion oh. and uh, how I log in. Uh, much to your uh, disappointment, I can tell. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm always disappointed when I don't uh, get to talk to her either. So anyway, um, I, I'm participating as a contractor in this meeting to simply run a math problem of the fact that the $550,000 condo that was mentioned by staff earlier in the presentation cannot be built for $550,000. So that being said, if you can't build that for 550 because of construction costs, partly due to lack of labor, partly due to all the other reasons why we know that costs are going up in our world, if you can't build it for 550, and a developer comes in and wants to build something but can't because they can't spread out the costs over 20% instead of 10%. Now you end up with zero units. And now you end up with that $550,000 condo going to $650,000, right? So uh, clearly this is all speculation. But in, in my simple brain, if you can't build it for what it currently costs to buy it, we have a major problem with the uh, with an affordability uh, issue of raising the threshold. Uh, under under my scenario, uh, twenty percent of ten uh, is great, right? Ten percent of ten is great. The problem is, is that if we are making this a regulation, is that we're going to end up at 20% of zero and we're going to lose all development, not simply just the extra couple of units of affordable units. Um, so, you know, we have a recommendation from the volunteer board of P&Z to say, listen, we don't think it should be raised. I think that there's other ways to get this done, similar to what Mr. West said in terms of reducing fees if there's additional housing units that then can uh, incentivize the developer to make this affordable. As he said, we live in, in an area in which the soil in much of the town needs uh, remediation in order to build on. It has really difficult terrain in which to build on. Um, and, and both uh, Mr. Rippey and Mr. Gregor had great points as well. I think that um, we need to focus on overall inventory increase, not simply affordable housing. Um, you know, the cost of construction is going up substantially faster than the increase in wages for the people that we need to house. Uh, so therefore, 
the math problem continues to not work. Um, I appreciate all your time and I, I uh, appreciate you listening. Thank you all for uh, your, your hard work and, uh, and thought process in this. Thank you very much. Anybody else in the room or online? Okay, we'll bring it back to council for further questions um, or uh, comments or motion. Go ahead, Paula. Watkins, what's the cost per square foot to build right now, a residential unit? That is a good question that I do, do not have off the top of my head for you. And you're 450, is that what you said? 450 is more certain. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay. And, and how many single family homes have been built in Glenwood roughly in the last five years? So I can tell you since 2016, uh, that number specifically single family homes is what you're asking. Mm -hmm. That number, I believe, is 17. So nobody's really been doing this anyways. Well, and again, single family homes would not be subject to inclusionary zoning requirements. Okay. Um, just the threshold. Townhomes as well. Do you know how many townhomes have been built? Yeah, yeah. Um, so townhomes of, of how many units then? What developments of how many units? Total units. Of any any configuration. Any configuration. But not apartments. Well, Town let's see. Um, I can tell you that since 2016, we've had 12 projects that were 10 or more. Okay. Um, we've only had two projects in that five to nine range. And so that's 17 plus a few more about, I think, 24 units that were in the one to four. Does that kind of give you an idea then? Yeah, thank you. Just trying to get a visual of we'll, what we'd be seeing in the future with or without the change. Sure. Thank you. Charlie. Yeah, I, I didn't support this at first reading. I still can't support it in, in a couple of reasons. One is we heard some feedback from developers, and that was one of my concerns the first time was we didn't really have a sense of the impact. The other thing that concerns me is that we passed the lodging tax to to uh, provide for affordable housing. We Sorry, can, we can you speak a little bit. We tax we uh, task the. Uh, uh, ad hoc committee with coming up with a plan. Um, I think we have a consultant who's working on a long-term housing plan and we're, excuse me, we're jumping the, the gun here and say we should be doing something when we haven't heard what that plan is and we haven't got the, the feedback on is this the best way to, to um, encourage affordable workforce housing. I, I'm all in favor of doing affordable workforce housing. I'm not in favor of doing it in a way that's going to Potentially, and I'm not sure that I can't say whether what I heard today is correct or not correct. I just don't know have enough information to, to say this is the right thing at, the, at this time. So I can't support this. I have a quick question. Did the Housing Commission, what was the Housing Commission's recommendation? Yes, their, their recommendation was to support the um, staff recommendation for the threshold change to five and percentage change okay. to one. Okay, thanks. Sorry. Um, Marco, then Shelley. Just, just a quick question. Since he asked about the Housing Commission, my question is, what was the original recommendation of the Planning and Zoning Commission, just for the record again? So the staff recommendation has been, been the same, been that. The Planning and Zoning's recommendation was to uh, not make any changes for for sale projects. So 10% um, uh, 10 units? Correct, correct. That was a 10, 10, okay. And then for rental projects, they recommended keeping the threshold the same, 10 units, increasing the percentage to 20. Go to 20. Okay, thank you. Shelly. It's really hard to relearn, right? Go ahead. Yes, okay. Um, I, I had a question and maybe someone else out there knows, but did our public comment, were they referring mainly to for sale units? Does anybody know that for sure? Uh, I, I, well, my impression was it was both. It they were just in general talking both, about just that in it, general. That okay. 10 percent was, you know, what it was now that they felt like 20 percent, there would be not another unit built in town. Okay, okay. Because, um, yeah, I was reading it more as speaking to townhomes and for sale units and not rental units. And 
I guess, are, are we in the comments yep. stage? Okay. My inclination here is just, there have been enough questions raised since we did first reading about particularly the for sale unit side, which we know we want to get more of, particularly, you know, even more than apartments. We need both, but we need for sale units also. So I am tempted to go ahead and stick with either what we approved on first reading, going to 20% for apartments. Um, I wanna hear from council whether we drop it down to the five threshold or whether we take PNZ's recommendation and stay at the 10. But I think on the for sale side, it might behoove us to just slow down a little bit, take time. I'm interested in working on incentives for for sale units, whether that's in the form of a density bonus or an extra story of height or whatever that may be, but in a way that we can incentivize developers to build more units in town. And, and at the same time, try to build some affordability in there and whether and how we do that. I don't know for sure. There might be different ways. And actually, um, Councillor Wusso has brought up this idea of if we build to the standard for condominiumization down the road, you know, in the seven years or whenever that statute of limitations is up, you know, will that work or not? I haven't heard from developers enough, but I would like to sit down with some developers and from the community that have built in our community for years and talk to them about what, you know, what they think might, might be workable. So I don't know if I want to make a motion to that extend if anybody's ready for a motion, yeah, but I'd have to go back to everybody here from essentially moving forward Second. with the planning commission recommendation as opposed to what you passed on first reading which well, the planning commission was staying at 10 and 10 um so over 10 units 10 percent deed restricted uh, which is what's currently in the code and then moving to for four states but moving four, to 20 percent on for everything four. else mm -hmm. are you okay at 10 or do you want to go to five as we did our first reading you know i think on apartments um I might be okay staying at the 10. Um, I don't know. I guess I'm interested for rental. Apartments are for rentals. Apartments are not for sale units. I don't believe. Rentals is 1020. Right. Yeah. Yes. The for sale unit you want to hold. That I want to and hold 10. and maybe give some direction on staff, or maybe we can hold a work session and decide where we want to go and what types of things we want to look into on that. But hold on the current regulations for for sale units. So that's my motion. Is there a second? I second. So I want to clarify some motion to the PNC recommendation. Um, no, I think it's a little bit modified from the PNC. So yeah. um, for sale units stay where they're at, at 10 and 10. Mm -hmm. uh, for rental units, it stays at 10. Um, for the, the threshold for, for the threshold when it applies but it moves up to 20 percent of units that's that that's pnz recommendation i thought pnz went down to five no, no. okay how is he did okay so pnz's recommendation yeah but as part of that recommendation i would um direct as part of the uh, official motion as part of the official okay. motion i would ask that um staff comes back to us or we can sit down and have a work session with staff to work on how we can incentivize more for sale units and um, looking long term to get more affordable for sale units within the city. How do we do that? Um, we have this ad hoc committee that's doing that right now. Well, they are, but that's all based on money. I'm interested in the regulatory side. No, I think that's not. A cross, not. I mean, I think it's. I think. I think this will come up in that context because it's a mixed question. Okay. Um, I think so what it is is really so coming back to you guys after this kind of moving through that process and getting back to you with recommendations. Okay, so if that's in the works already, then we'll just stick with the second reading for tonight. And I would be modifying from my vote at the last meeting and going, dropping back to the PNC recommendation. 
Okay, the motion by Shelley, seconded by Marco. Uh, Ingrid. Here I thought I was gonna, I was all prepped to to really go after y'all <laughs> and, I, and I didn't have to. Thank you everyone who has spoken this evening. Um, I, there were a few, there were a few contractors and, and local professionals who, who I spoke to who were out of town. I guess a lot of them do travel in January and February. And one of the, the, the key points for me is almost everyone said, have a work session. I'll sit down with you and I will tell you how you could help me make it so that I will build more units in, in Glenwood. Um, but that to me has been like the missing piece. And so much of the dialogue and discourse that we've had is that Ben West is wrapping up some projects here in town. What would make him or in, you know, in this case, make him not want to build and how we can we create a more um, supportive climate for for meeting our goal of having housing in such a way that it doesn't hurt the, the surrounding neighborhood. The density is not such that it truly changes the character of the community. But we we really well utilize the the infill opportunities that exist, and so I I really do appreciate that you all are were receptive. You were hearing an alternative to where you were last time, and I will be supporting Shelley's motion. Councilor Hershey, it's so exciting before it comes on. <laughs> um, you know the ironic thing, Ingrid, is that. If you were opposed to any growth, you would support this, you know, at a higher level. So I'm a no, no matter what. Just like I was talking about on the last issue, I, I'm not an economist, and I think you're messing in the free market, and you frankly don't know what you're doing. And you hear from people like educated people like Mr. Gould and Mr. Rippey, who tell you no. And I, I agree with Ingrid that you would sit down. I understand this is this is the reaction, but I'm, I'm still a no. Thank you. Councilor. Sure. Hold on, hold on, hold on. It was back and forth as well. All right. Okay. So he was, Tony, you were a no last time because we were changing it. But so you're a no to not change it now? Not to no to not change it. So we're not changing it. This is, this is, this well, is exact, this is staying as it is currently with the exception of the, the for rent units that's right. it but not for sale units so that doesn't have a lot to I do think I, I think i'm where charlie okay okay great thank you Councilor day thank you um i basically second shelly's motion because you said incentives um and you said slow down and let's look at the for sale uh, aspect of this and, and and i completely agree that i think maybe it's time to look outside the box and 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 not put up the stick first, but see if we can find carrots that we can give out um, and, and just bring it back to the drawing board and start thinking just in a different way of, of what can we do to attract um, af affordable housing developers and contractors, whether we end up with a tiered system where it's a percentage, whether we help with the 2C money, I have no idea, but I'm pretty sure we can all come up with something, including uh, possibly a workshop with some of the prominent contractors that we have in town here that are doing infill right. stuff. Um, so just wanted to give you my reasons why I support you, Marshall. Um, Councilor Stett, thanks. Marco? You know, um, and I like the idea that people want to sit down and have a work session with us. Um, I've been sitting in on housing commission meetings for my four years here and been involved in these conversations. And I hear incentive programs that are being devised now. I heard them when last year's ad hoc committee came to us and said, here's different ways that we could help the community invest in affordable housing. And I understand the, the cost to build and, and that burden on developers. I have to say though, from my perspective here on four years of watching developers come in and put developments in and have to drag them to get affordable units. Um, and some of them slipping in under the wire when they could or changing the way 
you know, rumors I've heard of, you know, okay, well, I'm going to make smaller lots so I don't have to fit within the requirements of when those affordable, there's not, I haven't seen the reaction of, we want to offer affordable, how can we do this working with the city? I just haven't seen it in my four years here. Um, so I have a hard time saying, well, let's slow down. How slow do we go? I've been sitting here for four years trying to figure this out and working on housing commission and working on these things. Um, when are they gonna sit down and have the work session? When are they gonna to come to us and go, here's an idea we have to help with this problem that you're having with affordable housing. And I don't think I can support going back on what we approved last time, because I think we, we're the only ones that can say you have to make a change. And it, and it might slow down building new housing um, it's slowed down right now anyways, because of the current um, percentage rates to, you know, to build and to buy. So I say we put things in place so we can move forward and then have them come to the table and say, how can we work with the, How can we work with them? I'd rather work with them with something in place. So I can't support the motion. So I'm the one that hasn't spoken yet. Um, I think that it's it tough be tough for me to support the motion as well. I think we heard from the developers tonight. We've heard from, you know, this is a housing affordability conversation. This isn't how do we make lives easier on the developers conversation. And our housing commission suggested a 2020, 20%, 20%, 20 percent, 20%, five unit, five unit. I, I don't make a lot of distinction between um, P and Z being a, a better or more superior board, uh, and no one's saying that, to our housing. So when I look at Staff recommendation, housing recommendations being 20%, 20% for five units and five units. And I look at P and Z. Um, I'm going to lean towards this commission and staff recommendations to make my decision while taking into account um, some of the points that P and Z has made. Uh, I mean, developers who said, I'll never build if it's 20%. We heard this two years ago when they were before us when we came at 10%. Um, it's not like, you know, people are like, well, I'll never build here if, 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 well, why haven't they yet? <laughs> you know, 24 months ago, we were at 0% and they weren't lining up. We didn't have the queue full of applications. You know, the free market, I think one of the things that is tough is the free market with housing is broken. It doesn't work. And so what can we do to get this? And they do this in Eagle. They do this in Carbondale. They do this in 850 other municipalities in the United States to some extent, and a lot in the Mountain West is 20% or more. Um, Vail, Aspen, I know we're not Vail or Aspen yet, but I think if we miss these opportunities, we we will become communities like Vail and Aspen. You know, we have all have said, all of us on, on this council has said at one time when we're trying to make our point, Glenwood Springs is special and we don't need to bow to developments we don't like. If that's still the case, then, then let's believe that. Let's act on that. Uh, I mean, the proof is in the pudding with 480 Donegan. We had a developer who gave away 20% of both free market housing, uh, uh, for sale housing and rental housing. So we know that it can happen. Um, now, whether it happens at five or 10, I, I don't know. You know, I, I, I'm not, I, all I know is we have a housing commission. We have an ad hoc commission that's working on these even more in depth um, to a different level. So, I guess I could support this, and I'm doing some some counting here. And and if I don't support this, I don't think that it passes. But I could support the motion if we if the motion was 20% at five units for rentals, and we were to kick the leave the 10% for um, uh, for sale, but kick it back to the ad hoc committee. I don't want to sit down with developers who are going to say, "Oh, you're going to hurt my profit margins." I get that. I, I mean, this and and, and it may be true. I'm not saying it's not true, but that's a very self-serving argument that they're going to be making, even if it is true. But the Housing Commission and the Ad Hoc Commission that's looking at these things, that's who I want to hear from, because I'm here to represent the community, not the development community exclusively. And I think that's who all we've heard from tonight. Um, yeah, I mean, if we really want to, if we really want to incentivize, I mean, the question of incentivization, if we really want to incentivize free market housing, or, or I'm sorry, affordable housing, we would take it to zero and we would cut our impact fees in half. You know, if we really want to incentivize for sale, but for sale units are not getting built 
in Rifle. They're not getting built in Grand Junction. They're not getting built in Craig. They're not getting built anywhere because the economic conditions, the financing, the land cost, the cost to build condominium units, it's just not there. Glenwood Springs also has the opportunity zone, which perverts the, the equation even further. So, you know, to think that, I mean, 10, 20% is going to matter and it's going to get uh, housing built uh, for sale housing. I, I, I just don't buy it. So anyway, let's, uh, we have a lot of other people that want to make probably comments based on my comments, but can, can we just clarify the motion before we continue? Yeah, let's, let's clarify the motion and then I think we can take a vote and if it passes great. And if it doesn't pass, then we can come back for another motion. Is that okay? That's fine. Um, the motion okay. is from what I understood from Shelly. The motion is basically. Hold on, hold on. Push your button. Did you push your button? Sorry. Okay. okay. <laughs> the motion is the PNZ's recommendation, which is to um, go to 20% on building of rental units at the 10% threshold and um, basically leave the for sale units where they are, I believe, which is 10% of 10 units. And, and I will clarify just, again, it's not in the motion, but my intent is to not completely throw out the idea of going to 20% on for sale, but it's maybe to finesse it and be more creative within our own community to come up with some incentives or other changes to the code that might make that work better, like a density bonus, like a, or some <clears throat> other things that can help us get more work here. I'm, I'm not ruling out 20%. What I'm saying on that is slow down on it. Ryan, let's call the question. It doesn't count until everyone votes, right? <laughs> well, this answer is yes at that point under the charter. Really? Yeah. Mayor Pro Tem Wilman, no. Councilor Russo, yes. Mayor Gotis, no. Councilor Dem, yes. Councilor Step, no. Councilor Kalp, yes. Councilor Hershey, yes. It passes 4 3. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, can I, real quick, it's 807. This is about the time we take a break. Uh, I had a very important text come in that said, Are you coming home soon? Because if not, I'm going to eat cake. It's, birthday, it? it's my daughter's 13th birthday. So could I, um, I would really love to take a part of the South Bridge right away update. Is there, would we be, there would be any support to uh, continuing it to the next meeting and then also allowing Councilor, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Wilman to take over my seat when we come back in seven minutes. I would make a motion to move South Bridge to, I would make a motion to oh. continue <laughs> I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, this got, you got to clear, close, nope, Tony, mic on. I would make a motion to continue the Southbridge update to the next meeting, which I believe is February the 16th, so and my, my birthday is February 7th, don't forget it. Oh, I won't. Okay, okay thanks. <laughs> I have a question on that, though, Terry, do you, you need to no, um, it's not set. Everything's set. Okay. Just, just an update. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Okay. Please. Can we take over? All in favor, say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thanks so much. Uh, Tell us happy birthday. Taking a break. Happy birthday, Nola. I'll be home in ten. <laughs>
Let me draw it for you. <laughs> get started um the next item is item number 12 ordinance 2023-04 um thank you mr mayor pro tem thank you um this is really a pretty simple change i think the easiest way to look at it is if you take a look at um the exhibit to ordinance number four um you'll see the current <clears throat> um no camping area uh it encompasses a portion of the downtown on this side of the bridge and moves over uh, onto the other side the ped bridge sixth street um, going out, uh, we have run into uh, some issues, some safety issues uh, under with the pedestrian underpass underneath I-70. And as you know, underneath um, current jurisprudence from the U.S. Supreme Court, we can't like universally ban camping or resting in public places. But when we are faced with certain situations, particularly when there are safety um, safety concerns related to obstruction of of uh, passageways and things like that. And you, you, I know have seen some of the photographs of the underpass when it starts getting kind of cramped in there and people are trying to go through on their bicycles or walking through that kind of thing. So we're adding that um, small piece, you see it just kind of as an outlier there um, uh, for the pedestrian underpass under I-70, nothing else in the ordinance changes other than underneath the current regulations, other than the map itself as to where camping is prohibited. Happy to answer questions. Any questions? Paula? Is there a reason, because I look at this T-bar kind of thing, is there a reason we don't just do the whole, um, that, I like the idea of under the underpass, but going through the tunnel and then up to the area, is that, it, it's just- uh, too Well, it's, it's a couple of reasons. One, there's not really any place to stop. Um, and two, um, uh, part of that, it, it starts getting into actually CDOT um, right of way in jurisdiction, and we just kind of stay out of that for the most part. Okay. Uh, which is why we were trying to narrowly focus, see if that resolves the issues we're having. If it doesn't, we'll take a, a major look at an expansion, but that's really, um, we, you know, we try to be very careful about not going too far because I'm trying to avoid a challenge. Right. Okay. And all of the yellow areas further down over the GID areas, that's all prohibited. That's all prohibited. And, you know, and we did that that way. And if you'll look, you know, you can move down 8th Street a little bit or over on to, um, you know, a little bit outside of that area. It, it That tends to be the area where we have the most issues, uh -huh. um, the proximity, the most activity, things like that, where people want to be. Um, but it's also a narrowly focused area that we feel like will um, survive a challenge if we were challenged on. Okay. Limitations. Okay. Okay. Paul, anything else? No, thank you. Shelley? Uh, just a quick question, Carl. Is the, so 
right now the yellow area also goes across the pedestrian bridge and on yes. was that existing before or is that new no that's that's existing uh the only change yes. that is being included is that just that little piece just underneath that I little think. piece that okay little thanks piece. all right any other questions oh. just quick you probably already said all this Go ahead. um why is the trail not yellowed uh it hasn't become necessary yet and in order to have the most narrowly tailored ordinance to address the particular issues um, so that we don't get a facial challenge on the whole thing i unless it's a problem specifically we don't include it no safety issues there for no safety okay. issues in the same way as long as the underpass is included oh i didn't have a question oh okay. this is a public yeah. hearing yeah, yeah, yeah. when you're yeah. All right, this is an ordinance. Uh, does anyone from the public wish to comment on this? Up the microphone, state your name, say with that you live in the city, and then you have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, Mike Fowler, live on uh, Riverview. I think we're talking the same thing here. I think you're talking about the underpass, but according to the map, I think the map shows under I 70, and that underpass is actually. Under 82. Is that? You're absolutely correct. <laughs> so I think we're talking the same thing. I just want to make sure that, right. that, it's, that it's clear. Yeah, the, yeah, no, we're talking about the one going underneath the pedestrian crossing. Because under I 70, I 70 is the bridge. And yeah, I mean, there, there has good been point. some yeah. issues there, but we don't have it at this point. You're right. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's all. That's all. <laughs> and I, I, I do walk through there every day and been talking to Marco about this for a while. So I appreciate you guys taking a look at this. No, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Any other public comment? Steve? Good state your name in the city or not. Stephen Smith, yes, I live in, in the city limits on Airport Road. Thank you. I, I apologize. This is a bit impromptu because I've thought about this. It didn't come to anything crystallized. I've been through the tunnel plenty of times this winter with, where people are there. And it first struck me as a little startling, but it also struck me as an excellent place to get some shelter. Mm -hmm. And the great majority of the people there were deliberately making effort to stay out of the thoroughfare way to narrow their, their footprint, a couple weren't. They were, you had to do some zigging to get through there. But I guess I'm a little hesitant to just throw out that, that uh, shelter opportunity in weather like this completely if some other approach that, that we kind of, I'm thinking oddly of the, the, the percentage of sidewalks that we allow restaurants to use for outdoor tables while still maintaining a passageway is there some approach like that that might accomplish two purposes at once? I think we're talking about an underpass that might have under microphone. Hold on. May, yeah. Maybe I'm mistaken geographically. I, I, now it, I want to. Sorry. Yeah, we're talking about it. We're talking about the um, pedestrian underpass um, that um, crosses over. Probably, Chief, do you want to come up and describe? Like, you, you can give all the right, left directions. Yeah. I was trying to pull it up here on, on a map for myself so that I could. Sure, so that's the under crossing. If you're on the uh, side of near Two Rivers Park and you're going to come over to the downtown area, you go underneath there. We have all the lighting against the walls there, and it brings you right up to the north side of the highway by 6th Street, which is where the roundabout would be. So you'd come out right at Sioux Village is, is what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Conversely, you could enter from Sioux Village and then go across uh, over towards Two Rivers Park. And then you go then you go underneath I-70 under and then into the park. That, that's exactly right. right. Okay. I've gone there, so I, I ride oh, my hold bike. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Your mic's not on. Yeah. So nobody's going to hear you. I'm just trying to get clarity. Like, well, no, that's fine. Can you do that one more time? Like, like I'm so sorry, but she's still. She, sure. I'm looking at the map. Yeah. So if you're. Uh, the map's wrong. Okay. Well, thank on you. On Sixth Street, <laughs> across from coming to come and go, directly across the street from there, there's yeah. an under there's a pedestrian 
right. short pedestrian tunnel way there, which people can ride their bikes or walk through, right. and, it's, and it's equipped with lighting and electricity. Right. From there, you can continue moving toward the south, and you'd end up eventually over by Two Rivers Park. And so my apologies there. So um, the GIS map had to go in right at the last minute. We were trying to get that done. Um, so if you think about that, you've gone underneath the <clears throat> underneath the regular underpass under I-70, and then when you cross over um, right before you uh, get to the what would be the roundabout, that's where that tunnel is. So that's fine. I just didn't understand what the way this map was colored. Yeah, no, and that's I I apologize for that. That got dropped in. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any other public comment? Sorry. No, that's all right. I have no control over operating the system over here. Okay. Um, let's bring it back to council. Uh Shelley. And Paul, if you want to talk to you, you need to press your um I Thank you, and I really appreciate the public comment, Steve. Yours especially, um, but and and yours, Mike. But we'll get the map corrected. But I do think the city is actively working with other groups in the area, a whole con continuum of care on so longer-term solutions for the homeless. I think um, it's appropriate, though, not to let kind of just wholesale camping in areas where it creates a conflict with residents wanting to move around or creates issues of the people feeling safe. I think it's appropriate to go ahead and not allow camping to grow and become more of a permanent fixture in, in those types of locations. I'm an advocate more of seeing long-term kind of a hand up and I'm hoping at some point we can get to where we have some temporary and permanent supportive housing to help people work their way out of the housing crisis and the homelessness crisis. But I would support um, the camping ban at this location because I have been through there several times myself and, and um, it was an issue getting through. So uh, my motion would be that we adopt uh, Ordinance number four, series 2023, uh, with the correction to the map as noted. Second. Got a motion made by Shelly, second by Tony. Tony, do you have other comment? Briefly. I, Mr. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, I would support this as well. Again, it's Mr. Uh, Hanlon has done an excellent job. There are a lot of, there's a lot of case law in this. There's a lot of issues. And Steve, I appreciate what you're saying. Um, a lot of people here, this is a choice. It's not just like finding some temporary shelter. This becomes a campsite and it's not safe. And it's not safe for kids and it's not safe for women by themselves. It's not safe for me. Sometimes I get scared too through there, even at lunchtime, you know, and sometimes I know some of these people too from my other job, but, and some of them are really nice people, but you can't ruin this town. We have to look, as Shelley said, to other solutions. So I really appreciate your comment, Shelley, and I'll be supporting mm -hmm. this. Thank you. Ingrid. And Steve, I do truly appreciate the, the thoughtfulness and the compassion that your observation made. I think where I am with this is that we as a community need to be proactive and designed in how we manage different demographics. And that that bridge was that that this area that you mentioned was never designed in order to be a homeless shelter. Um, and so I just can't comfortably allow that. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm, I am concerned that it has become that. And I think that this is a direction. Thank you so much for giving us some parameters to work within. It seems appropriate and necessary um, to extend the camping ban. And so I will be supporting this motion. Paula. Try not to talk out of turn all the time. <laughs> um, I, 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 we've had this conversation about our homeless population and it has brought, been brought up in the past that we need to find some solutions. And I have to say there's some great um, nonprofit organizations working with, um, you know, 
various entities trying to find solutions one at a time. Sometimes um, the net, the zero, what is that? Built, built, built for zero. zero that we're working with um, our vets. Um, but one of the things that has come up a number of times um, that hasn't really been fully expressed, developed, or looked at is a safe camping place for folks. And I'd really like to bring that back to the table. I'm gonna support this because I do think it's in a major intersection area um, and that we do need to take care of that. But I do would like us as a council and as a city to look back at providing some opportunities for places for folks to go to. Um, and it's been done in other communities. It's been done in Durango. It's been done up in Aspen for a winter or two. We have an affordable housing problem, which means people are living on the street because they can't afford to live in a place. So I'd really like to bring it back to staff um, and to this council to discuss again on how do we help the situation for the homeless. It's not just affordable and workforce housing. It's we've got to find some places to keep people safe. Thanks, Paul. Um, I'm just, Chief, maybe you can, if you don't mind, address this issue. Uh, Lieutenant Hassel is here uh, this morning. We were talking about other issues, but he mentioned, and maybe you could just kind of respond a little bit to Steve's comments. So Steve, I, I like way I appreciate, appreciate your empathy, but could you, could you explain a little bit the problem that there, what actually happens um, with cleanup and things like that? Certainly. So the city has endured some expense there with biohazards and some of the uh, other issues that are associated with this particular population. And we're finding that the folks that uh, Councilor Step is describing are people who find themselves uh, in a situation where the, the dad maybe lost a job or the, this is not typically the people that we're in, encountering. The people we're dealing with are chronic criminal offenders who are choosing that lifestyle who are involved in drugs. And we have, again, biohazards in that area, which is then transfers itself over to some of the restrooms we've talked about earlier, I think this morning and some of these other issues. And so we find that these people are the ones who are flying in the face of what the city, the spirit of what the city is trying to provide them with other services. And they refuse to take those, those opportunities to take advantage of the services that are being offered in this region. Um, notwithstanding the, the high rent and, and the cost of housing for sure. But typically we go there and we ask people to move along. We try to give them every opportunity to, to comply. And, this, and we can name them. I'm not even from here. I'm not going to, but I'm, and that's how familiar we are with these folks who uh, hope that we give them a citation because the only alternative in the criminal justice system, if they were jailed, is that they'll spend uh, approximately three days in custody. So they get a free, you know, free meals, showers, and those kinds of things, and they're back out on the street. And so it's kind of a re revolving door. We're in a precarious situation where yeah. we try to offer them the services. They choose not to take them, or and then they're in contempt, and they find themselves with a warrant, and they go into custody again. So it's a revolving door. But the city is expending a lot of resources and, and money on trying to provide services for them. And then uh, the enforcement piece of it is, is quite expensive as well. And I hope I answered your question. Uh, generally, yeah, I think Lieutenant Hassel indicated that he, he asked them to move along. They did in, right. in, the, in the level that he asked them to, but they left a lot of stuff behind. And then we have to come in and clean right. all and that our, up. And there are costs to the city. So. Yes, sir. And our, our we're used to dealing in that environment a lot, but our park staff are not. And they're the ones that are being exposed to these biohazards and and you know that's an obviously an issue as an employer for us, and then so we contract that out with professionals, and then there's another added expense that we're that we're into. Okay, thanks. Did I answer your questions? Yeah, I did. Thank you very much. Thank and I, you. I just I'm going to comment as well because I the I, it's just a very sad situation, Steve, and I think it's unfortunate we we have a group of population that we we that is in this spectrum, for lack of a better term, and I hope that we can find solutions. You know, we talk about the the uh, group. Go through zero, or about, I always get that mix up too. But I mean, the idea is, is is a comprehensive plan dealing with mental health and a lot of things for homeless people, and and we're working on it. But it's not a fast, and it's not an easy solution. So I'm going to support the the uh, motion as well. So with that, call the question. Did we put on the record, Mr. Mayor, Mayor Smith? Yeah, uh, I believe yeah. we did right when he left. He did. He called the recess and, and announced he was exiting. So it's clear. Yes. Everybody vote? Uh, I said you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. I couldn't figure it's It's a different button, you know. It's, way... <laughs> yeah, it's okay, Jonathan voted. <laughs> Can we just. Councilor Hershey, yes. Councilor Kaup, yes. 
Mayor Pro Tem Wilman, yes, Councilor Dem, yes, Councilor Step, yes, Councilor Russo, yes, it's unanimous. Thank you. Carl, can I vote five? <laughs> Okay, next North Lady update. Danielle, you're going to handle this? Uh, Danielle Cable, Economic Development Specialist. Um, I just want to do a quick update for North Landing. Um, we thought it was important since the last time we talked about this was whenever, I believe it was July 2022, whenever we approved um, the construction drawings with DHM that uh, the city and DDA split cost on. Um, so really what I would like to focus on is just kind of the timeline and what we're looking at. Um, we will be bringing this back to a work session uh, on the 16th. So we'll go into much more detail at that point as well. Um, but really on the big picture that we want to focus on is what this timeline is going to look like. Um, we started with uh, DHM uh, right in November, and we are looking at having 100% construction drawings by July. So pretty fast turnaround. And again, that intent is really to try our best to connect the 6th Street um, construction drawings with North Landing. So that's kind of why we're on a, let's say, heightened um, timeline to make sure that that can happen um, as best as staff can uh, moving this forward. Um, one of the things that we will be doing, especially from our last couple of work sessions is making sure that we are getting that input from the community that was a direction to staff. Um, so with that in mind, we did uh, just finish. Uh, I know a couple of counselors were at, in attendance as well on January 25th, um, where we kind of just really big picture started talking a little bit about the programming. Um, one of the things that we are building upon is that 2022 lookbook uh, that we completed uh, I think by the by that July timeline as well. Um, so with that, we're going to, again, be moving straight forward here on the 16th. We'll be providing you guys with uh, what the community has said, as well as um, our consultants have reviewed that community input and are working on the more refined from not only the feedback, but also design logistics of what can really work and how we can best move forward. So we're really looking for you guys, um, as well as DDA, because it will be a joint work session, is giving staff that direction so we can move straight forward into schematic design, um, which should be, you know, the nicer pictures, more detailed, different things like that. And that's going to be taking place till April. Um, and then we'll come back with an additional public meeting um, just to let folks know what that schematic design is looking like and get some additional feedback. Um, but by end of April, we'll hopefully be at 60%, which we will bring back to council and DDA for a work session to review, give us any additional feedback, and then we'll be moving straight forward to 100%. Um, one of the big takeaways I do want to mention to council is we will be, you know, every time we do these work sessions, it'll be really important that we get that direction to move forward. Cause again, we are on that tight timeline. Um, so we just wanna make sure that we are moving forward and making sure that we continue uh, not doing any extensions only due to making sure that Sixth Street is happening and we are all connecting on the same project. And of course that is a big reason of why um, we recommended DHM as a consultant since they are also doing the design work on Sixth Street. So just kind of that background of what's happening on the internal side a little bit too. Um, and with that in mind, I do need to apologize, Councilor Wilman. I will make sure not to do sticky dots. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we'll have we'll, we'll we'll shift it up a little bit for the March um, public meeting. Uh, it's it's stuck in my brain. <laughs> um, but with that in mind, I'm definitely open to any questions or anything like that. Um, but that's all. I, I had a quick comment. So I, I see that Chief Darius is not here, but one thing that I really want us to address at the work session is I'm not going to support creating another sort of homeless encampment, and I'm afraid that this is what that's what this is going to turn into. And again, I'm not picking on a group of people, but I don't want to spend all this money and create a great space like today by the elevators was another problem. And, and just so you guys know, and I didn't talk about it on the last thing, I see this in criminal court all the time, these, the issues that these create when there's a comp for, when there's a, a group meeting and the drugs and other issues. So that would be a major concern that I think we need to talk about. Thank you. Anybody else? And uh, 
Dave, with all due respect, um, I have been to all the sessions, not just the last one, <laughs> oh. on, on the North Landing, and there's been some very productive sessions of, and those are some group meetings and overall, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So um, I didn't mean any disparaging oh. comment by by that. I would like to you know, point out to Tony that it, in, the, in the meetings we've had, a lot of discussion has been how do we keep the area active to to try to prevent exactly what you're talking about. And that's really been a focus of a lot of the design. And, and there's been a lot of t staff time put in, in at these, is it three or four? We, this would, um, on January, this would have been our third one. Yeah. And there's been a lot of staff time and a lot of DDA, uh, Park Rec Commission, um, and the North um, Glenwood group have all been very active in, in this planning process. So it's been a real, that one I think has been real productive because it's real focused on that area. So. Um, don't take my comments. I think looking forward, bigger issues we were talking about earlier, it's different than maybe more focused issues like this. So anyway, all right. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Thank you, Daniel. Next, uh, Sarah, Terry, so it's you, item number 14, transportation planning update. Oh, she commented about this issue. About oh, about the update. Public comment on the update. On which update? Um, I'm sorry, did you want to be comment on North, North Landing? I do. I apologize. That's okay. No. Well, it's not yeah, yeah. yeah. Come on up. Okay, sure. No. <laughs> I thought you just enjoyed our company and that's why you were I here. Do. <laughs> so So I apologize. Anyway, okay. and um, Lori Chase, 705 Cowden Drive, Plymouth Springs, Colorado. And um, I really appreciate all the work you guys do and homelessness and and affordable housing. Whew. Anyway, um, to get right down to it, North Landing has been discussed and discussed for at least six years I have watched that park turn into a dog park, and I'm really sick of it. People, they, by and large, they pick up their dog's poop, but they're using it for a dog park specifically. But there's pee all over there. And I see people sit down on that lawn in the summer, and it is disgusting to me because I know what's been going on. So we need to move forward now. I'm sick and tired of the public meetings, stakeholder meetings. I've been to a lot of them, too. And what I see produced on the beautiful boards that staff has produced, and I appreciate all the hard work and everything, but we need to move forward with what the people of this community want. It'll make for a healthier community instead of having that vacant pea park there on that particular space. And I don't see a lot of homeless. The vacant pea park. <laughs> I, I talked to a lady, this lady stops, she pulls up in front of the art gallery, she goes over there with her dog, and she comes back, and I go, excuse me, this is private parking, what are you doing? She goes, well, I have to take my dog to go pee, and I went, okay, well, we have a dog park, and she goes, it's too far away, I don't want to walk to it, so just so you guys know. Please take care of this as fast as possible. And as far as the extra money you're getting for the renting the parking structure, maybe it could go towards this park. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> and, and Lord, just in general, I think that the plan for Sixth Street and North Landing, hopefully, would be a construction this fall. I'm probably more realistic next spring. But I keep on hearing it, you well, the, so. the problem is, is, is the, the Sixth Street plan itself is taking time. So. I, okay. I'm not thrilled either. I'll be very honest. So, <laughs> okay. Transportation update, Terry. Okay. Let me see if I can share my screen. Nothing is coming up. Um, I can see it here. Oh, good. All right. Yay. Okay. That looks like it's the full screen there. 
So good evening, Council. I'm Terry Parch, City Engineer. I just wanted to give you a brief update of all of the different transportation studies that we're working on right now. Um, right now, we have the transit expansion analysis going on. Um, we're working with Mead and Hunt, uh, consultant on the on the expansion analysis. Um, they've been working on creating a transit demand model. Um, it's analyzing, you know, population density, um, current routes, um, you know, stops and how well well they're used, current stops and how well they're used, um, population data. Um, age data, all kinds of things are going into this mm -hmm. transit um, demand model. Um, we're just about finished with it. And our next step is to go out to the public and um, then show them this demand model and then get their feedback <laughs> about what service that they they um, they feel like they need. Um, you know, this, this first part of it has been completely data driven. And now we're gonna go to the, um, you know, what service does the public need? Um, we'll bring those two things together and then bring you guys back a plan um, that will hopefully describe new service and then again, um, funding sources for that new service. Oops. The next thing that we're working on is um, the idea of the community safety project. Um, you guys saw a presentation earlier. Um, we do have a number of um, safety, uh, safety issues to address across the city. You know, pedestrian, bicycle, vehicle, um, intersection issues, transit issues. Um, we were recently funded for our um, for this process. We um, got a large grant from the um, Safe Streets and Roads for All, a federal grant. So we're looking forward to um, hiring a consultant and working through this process to, to identify these issues and and some solutions. Um, I know. Um, Shelly had some um, questions about our um, transportation management association development, the um, TDM program. Um, I put up the scope of work here. We do have, um, you know, all of these different steps that we've uh, that have been identified at least in the scope of work. Um, they have been working through the needs assessment, and we have started on the convening the partners. As you guys know, most of you attended the um, the public workshop that we had um, for the for the citizens. Our next step is to take um, that data that we we got from that process and then set up some of our business meetings. Um, I'd like to bring the consultant back to the council on the 16th to um, go over this process with you and make sure that the you agree on the scope of work. Go ahead. Yeah, um, you know, agree on the scope of work um, next steps um, because it is you know an important process for the city. Um, on the 7th, um, we are going to go in front of the county commissioners. Um, I have um, asked over the last few months if they would be interested in hearing about any of our um, projects and, and our transportation planning. And um, the commissioners did decide that they wanted to hear about our um, origin and destination study, as well as update on Southbridge and, uh, and the Lobo project construction. You guys have seen a number of these um, these slides before, but this was specifically developed for the commissioners. I just wanted to make sure that you guys saw this in advance of that um, that meeting. Um, this slide, you know, we wanted to um, to help people understand why this data was important. Um, you know, we really do see a strong um, commuting pattern, you know, from the Western Garfield County um, to and through Glenwood Springs. And um, we really would like to reduce the number of single occupancy vehicles on the road, um, hopefully to lower the accident rates in South Canyon, um, reduce congestion on I-70 and State Highway 82, and then reduce overall costs across the system, um, either with safety projects or costs of um, accidents and you know, costs of commuting. Um, one of the things that we wanted to show that the commissioners, and I know they've seen this before too, but I think it, it helps emphasize the point that um, we believe traffic will continue to grow. You know, our growth projections, this is from the state demographers, demographers office. Um, the graph on the left is um, the employment graph. Uh, um, and you can see that Garfield County is really projected to grow much, much greater than um, Pitkin County in terms of, of employment, um, similarly with population. Um, this was a graph of traffic volumes. Um, the red line below um, represents um, traffic from Western Garfield County. The um, projection line is based on the population um, increase per year. And um, the green line that you see up above is the um, traffic um, going south on State Highway 82, both projected to increase. 
um, that little bar represents the, um, the time that we had the TDM measures in place in Glenwood Springs. You can see that we had a significant drop, so those TDM measures really are worthwhile. 2020. Um, again, you guys have seen this, but um, the commuting data was acquired through um, the cell phones and um, that cell phone data set that um, happens when you um, allow the, um, the location of your phone. Um, we had various different periods that we averaged data across in 2019 and 2021. We did summer seasons, um, and then we collected um, data hourly and all day. Um, these were the cities that we analyzed, um, Parachute Rifle, Newcastle, Silt, um, Gypsum Eagle, Carbondale, Algebel, um, all the way to Aspen. And then we did our own internal analysis. And this is some of the data that we'll use for our TDM studies as well as for our internal transit analysis. These are the um, people that um, we see moving through Glenwood Springs. Um, we did analyze and check, the, uh, check our data at two different points, um, one at Grand Avenue Bridge and then one at a permanent counter um, off of Blake and State Highway 82. So um, of all the people that are commuting from Western Garfield County, uh, we wanted to know how many people commute south and where they're coming from. Here, you can see that um, we're about a 50-50 split. Um, at the point of Blake um, Avenue and, and State Highway 82, um, people going south are almost evenly split between Glenwood Springs residents and um, Western Garfield County. You know, we do see um, people from um, Eagle Vale and other areas, but um, for the most part, um, you know, we're about half of half of this um, half of that volume. Where are all these commuters going to? Um, this graph includes Glenwood Springs and Western Garfield County. So you can see the largest contribution is going to the Carbondale area. And um, as has been pointed out before, you know, I wish I had narrowed Carbondale down. This um, Carbondale area that I've um, got here really includes everything from South Glenwood Springs all the way through um, Carbondale. So um, you can see we've got a lot of people going into that, um, those industrial areas, as well as the city of Carbondale. Um, basalt and Elgebel, and then obviously all the way to um, Aspen and Snowmass. Of the people that are commuting into Glenwood Springs, um, we see the largest um, cell phone signatures from Newcastle and Rifle. Um, you can see um, some from Carbondale, um, Silt, Four Mile Road, but um, you know a lot of uh, people coming from Newcastle and Rifle that we would like to um, see if we can uh, figure out ways to get them out of their cars. Um, where are the people coming from Western Garfield County? Um, where are they commuting into in, in Glenwood Springs? And um, you, you can see that we see a, a really large signature, cell phone signature of people going to Valley View Hospital. Um, you know, obviously those are some jobs. Um, those are probably also people that are visiting the hospital. Um, you know, we can see a large signature going to um, Glenwood Springs High School, City Market, CMC. Um, Glenwood Meadows Commercial. Some of those areas can be combined and be, um, you know, into our downtown area. But these kinds of graphs give us um, an idea and an opportunity um, to work on either our TDM, TDM measures or additional transit, um, you know, from um, those Western Garfield County communities into um, these areas in town. So this is one of the final slides um, that I'd like to um, emphasize, I guess, with the commissioners. Um, we would really like to work with them to reduce those single occupancy vehicles, um, again, with the goals of reducing congestion on I-70 and State Highway 82, reducing accidents through South Canyon, and then reducing um, costs across the system, you know, cost of accidents, cost, commuting costs for Western Garfield County. Um, I wanted to emphasize to the commissioners as well that um, we do have some um, successes and efforts that are already, um, you know, going on right now. Um, we've already talked about our transportation demand management program. Um, we have that um, safety data um, analysis that we're going to do in 2023. And we are looking at the transit expansion study. And then um, RAFTA has also had a, a good success with their hogback route. Um, Ridership is up dramatically, up 57% in 2022 compared to 2019. 
Um, the service is still very limited in the morning, but I think it's one thing that um, is important to emphasize in this discussion that um, even with the small increase in service, um, they have seen a dramatic increase in use coming from Western Garfield County. Um, this is our Southbridge update for, um, for the commissioners. Um, our project is still at a 90% um, design level. We are beginning um, right away. We were authorized last week to begin right away. Um, funding, um, we are funded through this year, both for right away and for our final design. And then um, we have a series of um, grants that we are going to apply and reapply for. We'll reapply for the um, Rural Surface Transportation Grant in March. Um, we intend to uh, um, apply for the Federal Protect Program in March or April. And um, next month, we'll probably um, reapply for the Federal Raise Program again. The Loba Trail, um, Jeannie Golay is here um, to support the project. Um, she's been working very hard to um, help us backfill some of our funding gaps. And we did get a, uh, a bid from Mueller Construction for um, a little over 1.4 million. Um, we have a lot of community support for the Loba Trail. Um, Garfield County Federal Mineral Lease District um, has $700,000 towards the trail. And the city is supporting at 160,000. Garfield County itself is um, supporting with 150,000. RAFTA um, has 195,000 towards this project. Even Newcastle um, contributed to 15,000. And then um, Jeannie um, has a private donor that contributed 30,000 or 300,000 to this project um, to really get it off the ground. So we're looking forward to um, beginning construction on this section of LOBA. It is only 700 feet and it ends in a, in a shelter there at the end. Um, we're hoping that either with the South Canyon process or um, upcoming federal land access program grants that we might be able to extend this through to South Canyon. So with that, um, does the council have any questions? Hi, Terry. Hi. I, I did have questions on the TDM and part of it was, um, you know, we had, there was the citizen group meeting that was held at Mortgage Commons. I think Charlie mentioned it earlier. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm curious in that, I know we started the TDM process and the TMA with the consultant. I'm not sure when they started. It was quite a while ago. Um, okay. So council has not had an update that I know of, and I don't know if they've sat down with Transportation Commission. And I'm just wondering that, I'm I'm questioning the cart before the horse that there are there are a citizen meeting going on and I was at that meeting too and I I didn't see like a, the consultant there I didn't see any education of the public on what's the potential of TDM to work on that graph that shows the traffic increasing that's our whole point of it is to avoid that that perpetual growth. And um, so I guess I'm, that was my question on the TDM is when will council and transportation commission get to sit down with the consultant? And it seems like before we roll a program out to the public, we should have some goals set. We should have, you know, kind of a process in place and the strategies that we want to achieve. So I'm just kind of questioning some of the, the uh, sequence yeah. of events that are going um, on now. You know, it is um, something that um, Linda put together with the consultant. Um, you know, their ideas were that we would have a public group and a business group that would help them develop the techniques that they thought would work, um, you know, both with the, with the citizens and, and the businesses. Um, you know, they... Um, I think there are a number of TDM techniques that um, that could be widely applicable, yeah. oh, you know, almost anywhere. Blocks. But I think um, the purpose behind trying to get the group together was to get people that were really interested in in uh, addressing the problem, and then um, and then ask them for you know what techniques would work for you, you know, as a business or as a citizen. Um, instead of saying, you know, these are all of the things that um, that we could do, you know, what would you pick? Um, those but isn't kinds that, of things. it seems that we're paying the consultants for their expertise. 
to come in and give us, help us put a plan together on strategies that they think will work and going out to the public who is not educated on those, on that toolbox. I don't understand. Yeah, I, I'm just questioning that. And I'd love to have a work session on that with Transportation Commission and, and the consultants present in the room to, you know, have a discussion on, on how we put this together. Yeah, plan. I, I did talk to them and, and they're excited to do that. They'd like to go over the scope of work with you guys, uh, make sure that, um, that you understand sequence and and you know what's going to be done in each step and then ask if you know you feel like there should be any changes um because we're not that far along with this process you know we could change it up if if the um, council or the transportation commission had strong feelings about it so um is that the meeting on the 16th yeah okay we are yeah, planning to bring them here on the 16th i just want to see it be as successful as possible and someone who's been working on tdm for talking about it for 20 years in this city. I mean, we have a chance now, we have funding. I wanna see it be, be successful and rolled out in a way that it's it's a well thought out plan with strategies and, and goals. Yeah, and I, I, I totally agree. I do think though that, um, you know, one of the mistakes that we've made in the past, um, and we do have other um, TDM, plans that we found, you know, when we're going through um, our, our trying to do our filing up the mm -hmm. stairs, um, there wasn't really community involvement, right? We developed a plan. We said this, these are good things that we should do. Um, and then, you know, there was really no follow up with the community. Um, I think, you know, we as a city should lead this process, but we right. really need um, business and citizens to adopt it. Um, you know, we 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 can set our own standards, I think, for our own employees here at the city and and model, you know, those kinds of good strategies. But without community buy in, we're really at just a small portion of the of the of the problem. Right. So and I agree I, with that. I just I think the community needs education, too. So that's yeah, fine. I agree with you. Thanks. Thanks. And, All right. Thank you. <laughs> of course. Any other questions? Paula? Um, yeah, a couple of things, Terry, that I had. Can you give the trans transit expansion analysis you had up at one of your first yeah. slides? Yeah. Um, I, when I look at that, it looks like Ride Glenwood is going to become exclusive on 6 and 24, and Raptor is not going to be there any longer. Is that what I see, at least in this particular version? You know, this is actually our, our current route system. Um, there's nothing proposed on here. Oh, the, okay. um, the purple line is our current Ride Glenwood Springs route, and we are exclusive on um, 6 and 24. Um, I, it, is, um, it is one of the more um, successful um, routes, in, you know, that all, in all of the things that RAPTA manages. And we have a lot of people out there that really use this service. Um, and I feel like, um, you know, we need to, evaluate um, either it, it probably can stay on highway six and 24 but maybe the frequency of it in, increases so that we better serve some of these people so the local i'm sorry i, I misread the now i look at it the local valley bus that's rafta and that doesn't go down no longer goes down six and 24 is that correct that's correct yeah okay, the valley right. local turns okay the, the other question i have and you know it's been raised by a couple of people to me is your cell phone data may be flawed and and the reason that it's been proposed to me that it's flawed is if I come in from rifle and I go to city market and stop and go to Starbucks or pick up water or pick up lunch. And then I leave again, it shows that I, I have a city market ending, which is one of the things we see here. And then I'm going and I'm going to Aspen. So it looks like I'm leaving Glenwood and I'm a Glenwood citizen. Is that, is that an accurate does that happen with the cell phone data? It does. Um, so if you're anywhere longer than five minutes, um, you know, it counts that as a trip end and a trip start. But, um, you know, what what should happen with this analysis and what we've done is to average the data over a very long time. So um, on a Monday morning, you stop at City Market and grab coffee. It would only, I mean, and even if you did it every day, um, you're one data point among the 30,000 that commute along the corridor. So the data set is really only valid, um, you know, when you when you average it over a time frame. Yeah, and I just the reason that I question it and start talking is that because if I'm sitting on Grand Avenue watching 
I see lots of people coming across the bridge and they're not stopping. They're going all the way out and there. And so it seems to me a much higher percentage than 50, 50. So I, I just, it, just visually, and I'm not an expert in this by far, but that that's a concern I have. And particularly when I see those destinations, you got downtown, which is CMC, the city, the county, where a lot of employees there. You got Valley Hospital. That's not only employees, at the, but it's also people coming in in the morning because they have early morning doctors or, or, or hospital appointments. You're going to have any day surgery. You're usually going to be there at five in the morning or six in the morning. So, I mean, I think I think we need to look at that data. I'm not saying it's wrong. I think we just need to make sure we're we're getting accurate data and the flow through if we're going to solve this, this because you're not going to solve a single occupancy. If I'm coming in for a doctor's appointment, I'm only going to be by myself. Absolutely. So that, that, that's just some of the issues that I see. And, and I don't want us to get misled with bad data. So, yeah, no, I agree. And I yeah. think we need to look at it as broad patterns. You know, um, like you said, we'll never um, solve for the person who needs to come in for a doctor's appointment. No, and I know. But I'm what not. we could solve for is um, we see, you know, strong patterns from Rifle, from Newcastle. Can we increase transit service? Can we work with wherever they're coming from, you know, to try to offer ride share or whatever it might be um, to um, get those people out of their out of their single occupancy vehicles? Yeah, yeah. No, and I agree. I mean, I, the goal is is great. I think we got to do. We just got to make sure we're figuring out how to get, you know, before they ever get to West Glen. You know, we want to try to get, grab them and make sure they're not coming through single single occupancy. And that's Agreed. the key. And we talked about this in transportation when I was on the. Uh, the council representative there. So, yeah. um, okay. Anything else for anybody in the council? If not, anybody in the public want to comment on any of these issues? Thank you. Okay. If not, thank you very much, Sherry. I do appreciate the update. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Sherry. Okay. I'm skipping an item 15 that's been tabled next week. Council comments. I'm sorry. Can I Mr. Go Hershey. Um, I'm sorry, Charlie. I'm just, my back's really hurting, so I'm going to leave. Okay. 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 Thanks. Paula. Um, quick question, uh, Carl. I've been in a few conversations um, recently that there's movement on the land swap, and can we get an update that on that in the near future? We can. I would love to have something to report to you, other than the success process continues to grind. Um, <laughs> For four years, just so we know. <laughs> no, it's actually been six, but um, okay. you've only been here for four. <laughs> so, so I just wanted to uh, no, and and um, it, it, I'm gonna be having um, a meeting with Dan Gibbs on a number of issues coming up in March, and that's going to be one of mine. Is you know, you really as an administration want us to do things like housing, but then you put impediments in our way, like processing one of these applications at a time. And only getting through like three of them a year Ooh, yeah. and so we just need to have a conversation about efficiencies um so that's really the whole update right there okay i just have heard oh maybe it's gonna happen I, this summer I, maybe I, it, no, trust me like i i would like to have it done before i age out okay. <laughs> <laughs> just have to join me next week yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just want to say um, this morning I missed work sessions. I was at uh, Club 20 policy updates with your legislatures and stuff and just discussions for all of these Western Slope communities, which this particular um, gathering also includes people from Northeast Colorado and their concerns. It's more of a rural Colorado, but all of the topics that we talk about are on top of all of these people's minds. It's transportation. It's been fentanyl, it's um, affordable housing, and um, I just appreciate the, being able to go, to go to those discussions and hear what other people's solutions are and what they're working on, but also realize that, that it is, um, we have a bunch of people out there working on these issues with us, so. We're not alone. We are not alone. Okay. Oops. Shelly. I just had a, a question and maybe Carl has an update. I don't know, um, but it kind of speaks to the transportation things that Terry was just talking about. But this speaks to the east side of, of us, which is Glenwood Canyon and all the closures that we've had. 
weather related, accident related. So I. So uh, interestingly enough, both Jonathan and I separately uh, met with Director Liu today. Okay. Um, I can't speak for everything that he talked about um, as well, but I know that we both had a bit of a chat about the canyon and the closures. And I do think CDOT is going to take a look at some um, some sort of out of the box thinking for the canyon. Okay. Um, maybe you know thinking about it the same way they handle maybe the canyon uh, the tunnels. Uh, when Loveland one passes closed, passes. Mm -hmm. you know, there's been a lot of discussion both in the community and I know at, at higher, you know, in internal to see out about do we convoy, do we, you know, guide it through, how do we, how do we address this so that, yes, maybe you'll be delayed a little bit as, um, as commerce, but you won't be delayed 12 hours because I believe right. we had, I think we had three closures of the canyon in four days mm -hmm. and one of those closures was for 12 hours. And yeah. so, you know, obviously, we don't have a short detour. there's not a short detour. And so um, I think that it definitely was on Director Lou's mind. And, and interestingly enough, she was on both sides of the canyon during and through some of oh, that. because She's been up on the western slope for the last few days. Uh, so she's, you know, intimately aware of what's going on. And we definitely talked about it as top of mind for them to come Great. up with. There's got to be a different solution. Because it's not, you know, I mean, the number of man hours that they burn trying to address uh, a wreck like that, mm -hmm. uh, the overtime hours, state patrol, our crews, right. hazmat crews, depending on what's in the truck. You know, it's, you know, not, not even counting the impact on our businesses when that happens. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, good to hear. I hope to see progress on that at some point. Anybody else? Okay, um, Shelly covered the one thing, one of the things I want, which is Glenn Canyon. I think the significant concern and probably not going to get a resolution this winter but you know i was coming up back up and see my board meeting on, on saturday morning and it was closed when i left Glen, uh, denver and then when i got to silverthorne after setting spending an hour getting from georgetown to the tunnel on that side i mean just in backed up traffic i spent an hour outside of gypsum waiting for the tunnel open the second time so i actually think there were four closures one on friday two on saturday right. and then the other one so i in in a I know some of the works in the canyon now, and it, it's just very interesting to hear from somebody who works at first seat out of the canyon what's going on. And it's not, you know, it's just they don't know what to do either, you know, from an employee standpoint. So I, I think we've got to get there. Um, the other other issue we talked about a little bit this morning and just want to do it in public is I think there's a lot of a lot of conversation right now going about the Colorado River, water rights and states making agreements. We have what I don't know if the public is aware of this. We have what's called pre-compact water. And I brought that up this morning. And and um, I think it's, you know, once the new council's on board, we should we should have an update. I know you did that when I first got a council four years yeah. ago. And I think it's we ought to do it again because it's going to be a pressing issue. And I don't think it directly relates to us as I understand our pre-compact rights, but it might. So. Well, I mean, I think that um, it, it will impact us depending on whether or not a deal can be made on the river or not because we're talking about federal preemption. So it, it could definitely have an impact. Um, and, you know, there's both the how do we manage between states as well as how do we manage internally. And so I do think that bringing everybody up to speed as to kind of the lay of the land currently and some of the shifts in the landscape that may occur over the next few years is probably a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Last issue I would bring up and I said, oh, do you want to, I got to talk about the right of route. Do yeah. you want to? Huh? Okay. The the last thing that I want to bring up is the uh, right of first refusal. I talked to council about this, and I think it might have been even in late December because it was just a concept at that point. Um, I didn't write bring my notes. I think it was over there, but um, I had a I, I'm the CML board, as you know. I'm on the CML housing subcommittee. And the CML board had a vigorous discussion. So I was in Denver on Friday about this bill because it is now getting ready to be uh, submitted. It will be submitted by next Friday, the 7th. Um, and basically for the public, what it is, is that the, the representative from Fort Collins is proposing that governments be given a right of first refusal in a rural resort community such as ours on any sale of residential rental units of three or more. And we have 14 days to decide if we're interested in, in entering into negotiation. The Carl's got a memo, maybe he can go into that more detail. Really did a nice job in, in, in summarizing it for council, but I'll turn over to him, let him do that in a minute. 
Um, the change from when, and I was instructed to oppose this bill by council. This is gonna come up for another subcommittee meeting next Monday, and then probably another CML special board meeting next week before it gets introduced. So I need direction from council, how you want me to approach it. The one major change that happened since I first talked to you about it is an opt-out. And I read the opt-out the same way, Carl, but I'll let you kind of summarize that. Um, so Carl, if you wanna just kind of um, absolutely. I don't know if council had a chance. I sent an email out about it was uh, four o'clock, four ten, um, four oh six. Um, just a, a real quick run through um, on if any of the public is watching. Um, it is a right right of first refusal um, on residential or mixed use sales that include obviously residential um, for um, rural and resort rural, which we qualify as resort rural, that would apply to anything three, three or more, any transaction involving three or more um, residential units. Um, the uh, couple of things is that within a municipality, both the county and the municipality have the right to exercise that right of first refusal within the jurisdictional boundaries of the city. Um, triggering events uh, can range anywhere from uh, a listing agreement being signed to actually a contract being signed if you weren't using a real estate agent. Um, I, I think one of the more uh, kind of difficult things in my mind is the timeline that this creates, which is uh, upon receipt of notice, the local government has 14 days to express a non-binding interest, then 90 days to negotiate a contract, then 180 days after negotiating the contract to close. So literally, you could delay a transaction nine months and two weeks uh, if you hit the, the end of those things. Uh, and a quirk that I didn't include in here, I was, I was trying to get through it quickly, is that then if they have to go back out to the market, they have to give you that notice again. Right, because in nine months and two weeks, I guarantee you, you will lose the buyer that you started with, without without question. Right, um, so that that is a little problematic, um, and that's probably a little bit of an understatement. Um, the local government can waive its right to a specific property or for a duration of time, uh, and I have notes and comments that I would make on the bill, but it is unclear whether the duration of time is for all transactions or just for that one property. Uh, it's there's kind of classic sort of um, not crisp drafting uh, in this iteration of the bill. Um, I, you know, things in my read through that I would suggest uh, council if they, if they are willing to support or tentatively support, um, you know, I think that we need to clarify who, you know, who, who goes first if both county and, and municipalities are interested in the same property. I don't know that that's going to be as big of an issue currently in Garfield County certainly is going to be an issue in a lot of other counties. I can see it in Gunnison County. I can see it in Summit County, Eagle County, mm -hmm. um, Pitkin, uh, Route, like all of these um, where everybody is looking for housing. You're going to get into a war between the two, the two local governments. Um, I, I don't see the, the logical reason behind the three versus, you know, if you're, if you're not rural resort or rural, it's at 10. I don't I understand the logic there. I don't, I think it's just like throwing a dart. Um, so I think that needs to be dug into a little bit more. Uh, method of notice, and this is kind of a funny one, um, is by first class mail, which uh, it's also not clear. It's not clear whether that's on mailing or receipt. And I will tell you that in Glenwood, you are lucky that you mostly get your mail. Um, in the other communities I represent, the mail usually takes between 30 and 60 days to arrive uh, when it is mailed out. So um they're they're Down getting the street <laughs> yeah they're getting christmas cards right now um from early december in summit county I'm not uh, <laughs> yeah it's, it's actually not bad here uh, so we need to clarify that there should be an electronic notification i mean this is the 21st century um whether the legislature thinks so or not um and then the time time periods are just too long and the waiver provisions need to be clarified I mean, those are kind of the big picture ones that I kind of have identified going through the bill. Um, I don't even know if council wants to, you know, take a position on this or not. Um, but I do think that if you do, even if you do take a position, um, I would include some of those comments in your position that like, hey, we need to fix this stuff just in case it gets passed. And let me just comment a couple of things. And the meeting we had yesterday, I think it was yesterday with a representative from Fort Collins on the number of units, I think that's a negotiable uh, from his point of view, I think the email and stuff, I think, right guy, they can figure that out. Yeah, the city, county, that kind of stuff. And also the timeline. I think all those things 
are things that they would be willing to negotiate. Um, the other thing I will say is in the vigorous discussion that happened to the CML board, the issue among fairly, it's fairly large number of the board and the board may not support this. I just need to know how to, what I need to do on your behalf, but the, the, is let's notify the municipalities, let them go in and negotiate like any other entity would. Um, the downside of that is pointed out by the representative is a lot of times by the time that notice gets to the city, there's always some de deal cut and you're never, you're not going to be at the table. So, I mean, and so those are the, those are the kind of being things. So that's all I have really on that. I'll just, one other mention, because it, 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 Jonathan mentioned it in the cast, it came up as well. There are some, there are, I don't know if they'll ever reach fruition, but there are some other, there's lots of housing bills are going to get introduced, but the other big one from a municipal standpoint is a possibility of statewide zoning of certain things. And I won't go into all the details of that. And I don't know if any of this stuff will ever, ever, if ever actually hit the legislature. So, but those are some issues that are out there this year. So I need, I need direction. Other questions? Yeah. Is this this is not to do with the mobile home no, legislation that we've asked you. Yeah, yeah this is this is any residential transaction. Any at all. That includes three or more units. Okay. So if you're selling a triplex in total, uh, underneath this proposed bill on a rural resort or rural community, you would have to notify uh, the local government, both county and, and city, that you were doing that. Um, and then they get first right of refusal. And then they get a first right okay. of refusal. Thank you. Any other questions? Not questions. Okay. So my my inclination is not to support it. I, I'm. We have every right to put an offer in as a municipality on any property that comes on the market. So anyway, we can buy anything we want. I mean, something pops up. You hear about a sixplex that comes up. We hear about something coming up. We have the right to put an offer in. The only difference here is that we become notified of it immediately. Well, USPS immediately. Um, and then we also have a right of first refusal, meaning that if we do hear that there's a private sector buyer that wants to buy it for a million dollars, we can come in and match that. But then there could be a bidding war. Um, I guess where I'm at with it is that we have some other vehicles that we've recently passed in the city that will help us support our housing situation mm -hmm. way more and maybe more equitably than us trying to buy individual properties. We're just, we don't have that deep of pockets. And I don't know that we want to be in the landlord business. I think what, we'll, what we as a council, and I, and I could be wrong, but I think we're more inclined to support the development of or you know using 2C money to get units, but it's not buying them from the private sector, existing property. So my inclination is not to support this. I don't like, I, I think that there's enough other, um, I guess I need that. Uh, <laughs> um, there's another, there's enough other housing bills out there right now that I think they're going to start competing. And I think they're going to um, create quite a, a messy environment that we become too opposite from where we are right maybe right now and my inclination is not to support this and let it simmer a little while see if there's some better opportunities out there and see some of the things we already have how well we can work with them i, I one comment on what one thing you said Ingrid, okay. just so it's clear to the public too is that although we have the right of first refusal the right to buy we can enter into, into public private partnerships such as with habitat mm -hmm. or someone else we don't have to own the property we could actually and i, I goofed it yeah. up this morning but we could actually transfer the property to a private entity as long as they they um uh, as long as it was restricted follow. there's there's restrictions right. i was going to say the one nuance that i might if council there's a little bit of a middle ground we talked about it this morning um I, I do think there may be value um, as I'm watching these um, low income housing projects roll off of being restricted and going to the free market. These tend to be larger 50, 60, 70, 100 unit developments underneath particularly the LIHTC low income tax credit programs. That first right of first refusal to maintain current affordable housing mm -hmm. in a community, I think that has, that's very, has value. that has value and is yeah. very different than Three units. Yeah, then three units. Exactly. And the other point I just realized we were talking and I didn't say is that if the city would buy this or enter the partnership, mm -hmm. 
the only reason this exists at all is the housing it has to be affordable housing mm -hmm. for rural resort right now that would be 140 percent of ami so that's one factor i didn't i didn't mention yeah. in that so, so that's, that's I important i will revise where i stood on this and say that i would be comfortable if the threshold was higher um and that we were talking about more than three units because i just don't think we need to be abreast of every three unit development. Got a, got a number you want to throw out there? Um, I would say 40 plus, 30 plus, okay. but I'm negotiable. No, no, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, I'm asking because that, that's a question. I would have said 25, 25, 30, something like that. Yeah, that's just a question that's going to come yeah. to me if I go to sure. the board. So, um, yeah, the other, the other issue is, is just a bill that says we're notified. So mm -hmm. if there's something like that happens, we're notified because a lot of those big projects, you wouldn't see as a realtor. They're, they're, one big company is yeah, going to go talk you know? to another big company. They're going to have Absolutely. done it. We're not even going to know about it. And then they're going to throw everybody out and because, because they're expired. They don't have to have affordable. Yeah. And they're going to they're going to make it uh, market rate mm -hmm. housing. So, I mean, that's, there may be just, even if it's not notice. Mm -hmm. um, so, mm -hmm. so the sense I have, oh, sorry, Shelly. There. I'll just comment quickly. And I, I, I agree with some of the concerns that Carl raised and and I'd be okay too going with that across the statewide 10 units, you know, or something that's consistent across statewide. I don't, three is too little, 10 might be too low of a threshold, but 10 to 20 seems okay to me, somewhere in that range. But I have a real concern about bogging down the whole realtor buying process. I mean, they should give a set amount of time, whether it's 14 days, 20 days, 30 days, and and that's it. You get the deal done. You don't um, drag it out with, you know, up to nine months and and then shut down the whole process of free market. So I think if a municipality is on top of it or a county and they've got monies available and partners available, they have processes in place and they could take advantage of a deal and make it happen in the same time confines as a as a typical real estate deal, but not drag it out. So the takeaway I have is um, support of it is directed toward current existing or uh, affordable housing. Make sure we get notice and opportunity. Maybe they're even right at first refusal. Higher threshold, thirty plus somewhere in that range. No set real number, but in that range, and a shorter time frame if it's going to be there. Is that? Is that to on Shelly, I would say 20 to 25 years, if that resonated better with you. Okay. Okay. All right. Is that? No. Now I can. Go ahead, Paul. Um, I agree with what everybody's saying. I think those are great parameters. Um, the only other thing that kind of is stuck in the back of my mind, and I don't know this exactly, but I know that there has been some stuff already with the mobile home parks where people have put together an offer and then it kind of gets caught up in something with another bidder and and then the person selling the property ends up kind of backtracking on whatever agreement he has with purchasing this mobile home park from those residents and that would be the one thing that I'd be interested in is if this if the city or county or whatever government entity got involved in this that there would be some kind of parameter that would protect them from and I don't want the 120 days. Yeah. Well, it's something it's that kind of price gouging. Or yeah. Yeah. It's like, okay, well, I just got counter offered and now you have to bring in another 500,000 or a million dollars to the table. Yeah. The current, re the current yeah. restrictions on selling mobile home parks. Is... And, and I don't want to make this mobile home. I just want no, to no, say but... when they're looking at this, yeah. that we, you know, if we, if we get involved with that at all, that there's an opportunity it, we we currently do, but there are problems with it. Yeah. There's no question. But I mean, if the community, a mobile home park within Glenwood wants to be sold by the owner, um, the residents have to be given a right to purchase and the city can come in and help them do that. Housing authority can come and help them do that or a combination of those. So, I mean, there are some avenues there. There are some, okay. uh, apparently still some problems and I'll, I'll, I'll mention that at the state level and see what, if there's anything we can do to tweak that bill. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. I th Ingrid, do you have something else? Yeah. Um, Jonathan wasn't here, and he wanted me to share his suggestions or kind of a little bit of the feedback he'd received from others and what he talked to Shoshana Liu, director of CDOT, with today. 
um, there was a suggestion that they start staging when the weather, only when the weather is bad, stage these larger long haul vehicles, long haul trucks down in rifle and almost have a, a snow plow lead them through the canyon, um, which would allow passenger cars to pass them, keep them going a certain speed, and they could we would just have to wait every half an hour or something along those lines. She asked, would your council be supportive of that? And he said, let me ask them this evening, but he had to leave early for his daughter's birthday. So curious if there's some um, support for that. I don't know. I'm I'm following direction, Marco. Sorry, just are you guys okay with that? I, I think if I if I can, the reason it's important is because we are one of the most impacted communities when the canyon closes. And so you know, that would change traffic patterns if they're, mm -hmm. you know, leading a, a group of, you know, every 30 minutes they're bringing 30 trucks in a row, uh, right hand lane only through the canyon to try to, you know, keep that canyon open. Does that sound like something you guys could live with? Are you supportive of that? And and it doesn't necessarily need to be a long-term solution, but certainly we need to do some type of solution to prevent what we have been having so commonly happen. And then maybe we can, between a couple of different groups, come up with a long-term plan. I support it. Okay. Shall we? I, would su I support that too, especially if it's controlled. Mm -hmm. The trucks are controlled. They're not passing. Yeah. Yep. And you can also have vehicles go through. And it's it's all about the speeds mm -hmm. to me. And the, the speeds are not honored in the canyon and mm -hmm. certainly not weather appropriate, as is obvious from what we're seeing happening. So if they have mm -hmm. solutions they want to try, I'm, yeah. I'm all for it. Okay. I'll yeah. give Jonathan, Jonathan that feedback and um, he can share that with CDOT. Yeah, I agree. I mean, if you think you come up with a, even a temporary basis to try to solve some of the problems, it's going to be good. I think it's going to make some of our business people community happy as well. So any other council comments? Well, I have another thing I'd like to take up since I'm here in the chair. I'd like to talk for a couple. Is there a motion to adjourn? Uh, do you want to hear from? Steve? Oh, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna say, let's Sorry. be really clear. I put I put my agenda up because I was writing notes on it. Steve, comments from I apologize. <laughs> no, just a couple of quick things. Um, financial advisory board grants got launched last week. So if somebody asks you, they'll be due in April, and then we'll have a recommendation for you guys the first meeting in June. Uh, Fab heard from the historic preservation or historic museum um, at our last meeting. They do have kind of a recommendation that they're pulling together. They're going to talk about it again in February, so we'll be back to talk about that in March. Uh, and then the last thing I would say is that most of the ski passes are being used most days of the week. There's been a lot of usage, so right. I thought right. you guys would be interested in that. Yeah. So yeah, we got to keep track of that for next year too. So, Carl, uh, just a couple of things real quick. Um, following up on the housing conversation, um, I think that um, Jonathan and I are going to be meeting with the uh, governor's staff um, regarding the kind of the, you know, this proposal for upzoning and how does it work out in the 12 rural community, rural resort communities that got called out in the state of the state address um, to the surprise of many of us, uh, at least six of my clients. <laughs> um, so we're going to be having that conversation, uh, hopefully sometime in the next couple of weeks. Um, had a really productive meeting with a new set of attorneys hired by the Mitchell Cooper. Um, so I'm hopeful that we can make some progress there. Uh, it, I mean, every every plan is great until you run into your client. Um, so they were fantastic. We'll see where they get and they understood where we were at. And uh, so I just want to let you know that 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 was a positive coming out uh, of this week. So that's kind of just briefly quick updates. Um, continue to. Um, sort of monitor uh, talking with both um, state level officials as well as our congressional delegation as well as the BLM regarding the recent slide out at RMI um, and kind of what that means long term what that means to those various agencies um, the uh, uh, DRMS uh, the mining section did issue a, a, a letter um, calling them into a hearing to sort of explain what happened um, I think that's going to be sometime in March that that goes to hearing. Uh, so there again, we'll monitor and see if it's appropriate to provide comments as we get closer to that. So that do you have an idea where that's going to be? Um, it's probably sometime in March. No, where location? 
the what? Where will they do it here? Or they? Uh, no, they'll it, DRMS. It'll be down in Denver. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So that's it. Now anything else? Sorry, guys. All right. Uh, should be the second meeting in March. No. First meeting in April. First meeting in April. She's coming in on the twentieth. Uh, because of the way March lays out, your meetings are early in March. Um, and then we'll all be gone for spring break because it's spring break. Charlie, <laughs> and then... there's a letter. There's a letter. There's a letter. Oh, do I have it? No, but it's in correspondence. Yes. Oh, correct. All right. Mark, Sorry. please help us with the letter. I, I don't yeah, have it in front of me. Hang on. <laughs> I can. If anybody assist me, please. I already closed the back. <laughs> Hang on. I'll get there. Thank you, Brian. Okay, and I totally missed this when I reviewed the agenda packet. So there is a letter uh, from the city to the US, uh, United States Environmental Protection Agency, letter of support for Picking County Consumer Recycling Education Outreach and Solid Waste Infrastructure Recycling Grant Applications. And Carl, since I haven't had a chance to read it, can you give us a quick thumbnail? What I can't because I didn't, I, it was a Jonathan thing. I read it. Okay, <laughs> and you can read it. Picking County is doing program. They've applied to the EPA and we are giving them as a local community where we're encouraging support of the application at the EPA level saying, please give them this, um, this grant. I think it's great. Yeah. 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 They have applied for the consumer recycling education and outreach grant and the solid waste infrastructure for recycling grant. And so we are if we're all receptive, are we su supportive of this? And I am. The, fi the final paragraph says the city of Glenwood Springs supports Picking County's efforts to increase composting, recycling, is ready to be engaged in support of Picking County grant projects moving forward. We're already preventing, we're planning our own efforts to increase composting and recycling in align with Picking County and to maximize waste diversion in our shared region. Please give them the highest consent, their application, the highest consideration. Did you think my summary was insufficient? You did, I just read the actual recommendation. Okay. No, you did a great okay, job. Cool. I just Thanks. read the, no, it was wonderful. Okay. I got a chance to read the letter too. Um, so is, is everybody okay with the mayor signing and sending sure. that? Yes. Okay, sure. mayor's dead sign. All right, now I can I adjourn? <laughs> there was a motion adjourned by uh, Shelly, second by Marco. Or okay. somebody, yeah. uh, all in favor? Aye. Right. Opposed? Thank you all. Thank you.